Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we got a great turnout here tonight and I do think it shows uh, what tremendous interest there is in protecting clean water here in Ann Arbor. Uh, my name is Jeff Irwin. I am one of your state representatives. Uh, I have the honor of, together with my colleagues, hosting this event. Uh, when I say together with my colleagues, I mean the whole Washtenaw County delegation. That would be Senator Rebecca Warren, uh, Representative Adam Zemke, who's here in the back. Uh, Representative Gretchen Driscoll, who's right here in the front, and our colleague from Ypsilanti, Representative David Rutledge, who couldn't make it tonight. Uh, so once again, my name is Jeff Irwin. I represent uh, the 53rd District, which is wholly contained within the city of Ann Arbor. And we're here tonight to hear a little bit about the uh, changes that are happening at the state DEQ and the changes in the cleanup criteria for 1,4-Dioxane. Uh, many of you have been watching this issue for many decades like I have. We've also got folks like Roger Rail, who with his group, Sio Residents for Safe Water, srsw.org have been tracking this issue uh, at a very detailed level and we've all been watching this locally and I can say that it's not just us uh, legislators in Lansing who've been watching this closely but we've been working together with a team of local officials that include the county the city and many of our township officials some of those folks have joined us here tonight and I have the uh, honor and obligation to recognize many of them our water resources commissioner Evan Pratt has been uh, present at many of these meetings up in Lansing we've got some of our county commissioners Felicia Brabe and uh, Conan Smith are here. They've been present at many of these meetings. And I have to tell you that when we go up to Lansing to lobby uh, for a better cleanup on this site, uh, we're always joined by these individuals who are here, but we're also always joined by folks from the city of Ann Arbor. Our former mayor, John Heath, our current mayor, Christopher Taylor, have been very, very active. Many of our council members have been active. I think uh, Jack Eaton is the only council member who could actually be here tonight. Oh, and oh, in the back, we've also got, oh, and here's Mayor Taylor has arrived, uh, uh, council member Briere has been very involved, Councilmember Chip Smith and uh, Councilmember Chuck Wapahowski are all in the back. I know they have to leave early though because they have a council meeting tonight. I didn't want to schedule on the same night as a council meeting, but when we had the uh, agreement from our state uh, DEQ director, Keith Cray, to come tonight and talk to the community about what this uh, better cleanup standard means for hopefully a better cleanup here in Ann Arbor. I knew that I wanted to take that opportunity and the great turnout we have I think is evidence that uh, this is an important meeting and a meeting that we had to, to have as soon as possible. So before I have the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Keith Cray who's going to come up and talk to us about what the state is going to do with this better uh, cleanup standard for 1,4-Dioxane. I want to introduce some of the local uh, folks who've been activists and local public health officials and environmental health officials who've been tracking and monitoring this plume for many, many years. Uh, those of you who um, have been watching this closely know that we have a group here in uh, uh, Ann Arbor called the Coalition for Action to Remediate Dioxane. And these are individuals from city government and county government and local activists who meet together on a regular basis. They've been doing it for over a decade to try to make sure that they uh, keep in touch with exactly what's going on with this plume, exactly where it's moving and how fast so that we can do the best job that we can locally of advocating for uh, a, a better cleanup and more responsibility on behalf of the polluter. So uh, with that uh, significant preamble, I want to welcome the folks from CARDA and hand off the microphone to Jennifer Kahn with Washtenaw County Public Health. Okay, thank you, Jeff. So I'm Jennifer Kahn with Washtenaw County Environmental Health. Um, this is a presentation by CAR to the Coalition for Action on the Remediation of Dioxane that Jeff just mentioned. So what is CARD? Um, it's a partnership of the local governments and citizens. Um, as far as the local governments go, we have representatives from Washtenaw County, Sio Township, Ann Arbor Township, the city of Ann Arbor, um, as well as many citizens who come. We meet monthly. Um, they're all public meetings, and quarterly we meet with the DEQ as a technical advisory group where we have um, experts from like Wayne State University who come and we discuss the plume and its movements. Um, so just a really brief timeline of the contamination starting with um, 1963 when Gelman Sciences began manufacturing medical filters. So from 1966 until 1986, they, the area in yellow, um, Gelman Sciences used 1,4-Dioxane in their process and discharged wastewater containing the 1,4-Dioxane into seepage lagoons, um, a deep injection well, and also by spray irrigation. 
1985, the first contaminated residential wells were found, which prompted Gelman to stop using the dioxane in 86. Lawsuits between Gelman Sciences and the DNR at the time, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, were settled in court by a consent judgment in 1992. And at the time of that consent judgment, the state cleanup criteria for 1.4 dioxane was three parts per billion. Um, in 1995, that went from 3 to 77 parts per billion, and in 2000, it was raised again to 85, which is where it currently is. In 2005, the prohibition zone was established. It's an area of court-ordered restricted groundwater use. In 2010, EPA's IRIS um, integrated risk assessment folks um, updated their increased cancer risk level for dioxane from 30 parts per billion to 3.5 for a 1 in 100,000 increased cancer risk. In 2011, the consent judgment was amended for a third time, which expanded that prohibition zone of restricted groundwater use. The DEQ was charged with updating their, all of their Part 201 cleanup criteria by the end of 2012. They did miss that deadline and have just now proposed in March, um, well, now April of 2016, their new cleanup criteria. And for 1,4 dioxane, that will be 7.2. That is the draft proposed criteria. So now I'm going to pass it on to Roger Rail. So I'm Roger Rail. I'm a co-founder and chair of SIA Residence for Safe Water. So I've been watching over this for about 23 years. So here's one of my mashups. This shows that they used 850,000 pounds of dioxane for 20 years from 1966 to 1986. That's that red dotted line. And then Gelman had an estimate of 64,000 pounds left in the aquifer. And then later they had to up that estimate to 80,000 pounds. And to date, as of December 2015, they've removed about 111,000 pounds of dioxane. Now at that rate, which is about 1,000 pounds per year, they will only have removed 136,000 pounds by 2040. And we don't know how much is going to be left. We still don't know how much is left right now. They're pumping at about uh, 500 gallons a minute. They're permitted to pump at 1,300 gallons a minute. So they reduced their pumping over the last several years. Is it, what's the down, just the down here? This next slide shows what the cleanup, uh, what the, the plumes were in 1992 before the cleanup began. And then the latest plume map of 2015 after 22 years of cleanup. So this is after removing 111,000 pounds of dioxane, more than they said was down there. So we're still left with this gigantic plume of dioxane, some of which is moving uh, towards uh, water supplies. And this map shows that the black circles show the highest ever readings for those wells over the last few years. The yellow, there's a couple of yellow circles down near the bottom. Those also show the highest ever readings. Now those are yellow because we don't have enough data to actually plot those accurately. Those are estimates of where those wells are. So there's, there's data that's missing that we're trying to get filled in. So again, you can see that there's black dots all over around the plume, so it's spreading in pretty much every direction, including down. So I'm going to have Matt Nod come up, the city environmental coordinator, and continue on. Thank you, Roger. Um, I'm going to just go back one slide. Uh, for those new to this, the red area and the purple area, those are the prohibition zones. The area is east of Wagner Road. Most of it's under the city, so most city residents where virtually no city residents have wells. And if you do have a well and you're a city of Ann Arbor resident, please let me know, because we may need to talk. Um, so you're all on city water, and we don't get city water from under that area. So we'll talk more about where the city gets its water. But I'm going to talk about a few of our concerns. Um, plume expansion, cleanup criteria, data sharing, uh, oversight of the cleanup and some uncertainties that we think are still out there. Um, so 
the number one concern for the city of Ann Arbor is could this get north to Barden Pond? And so this is a mashup that Roger's drawn. It's kind of 3D and most of the contamination is moving to the east and it's gonna go under the city and probably vent at the Huron River with no exposure to city residents. I live right on top of the plume. But there's an area to the north that we're seeing increases in the concentration, some wells that were non-detect. And that's something we've got some concerns about. So here's a flat map. There's a couple of wells that those graphs point to and you can see that concentrations are going up. And there's two wells um, in the very northern part of the prohibition zone. So prohibition zones designed so that dioxane really shouldn't go north of there and those wells tell us. Um, so here's a map in 2014, these two wells to the north by 94 are non-detect. 2015, one of the wells starts to show detections of 1,4-dioxane. 2016, both of the wells um, are showing low levels of contamination of 1,4-dioxane. Thank you. No, Roger can be my designated pointer. And um, I've only been working on this for 15 years. Um, so now we're in a situation where the next, we don't have wells where it's non-detect, so we know it's not going to Barton. So we've uh, invested some of our own money in outside consultants basically showing that most of this we think is gonna go east, but if we wanna be sure it's not going north, we need more wells in that area and we need them more closely spaced together. So those are some of the asks that we have going on. Um, one dioxane doesn't break down like other chemicals uh, in the water. Sometimes critters eat them. one dioxane pretty much doesn't happen. So as Roger said, we're gonna be in this for the long term. Um, once the dioxane's underground, it's gonna be there for a very, very long time. Um, we're concerned that this prohibition zone was supposed to be the area that one dioxane is supposed to stay within, and now we're seeing dioxane on the edges. So that's a concern. Are we gonna to have to keep expanding the um, prohibition zone or do we need to start pumping and treating if those wells get higher? Um, for those folks not in the city, out in the townships, where a lot of people are on private drinking water wells, it, it's not, there's not a water pipe right in front of their houses. So any need for long-term water supply um, would be a discussion between the city and the township and take a long time to engineer and get that out there. So we wanna make sure we're ahead of the game if that's required in the future. Um, we've also got some concerns that now that we're starting to see concentrations in the north, what's the contingency plan? We don't want a contingency plan for how we would treat this at the Ann Arbor water plant. We want the contingency plan that says, here's how we're gonna treat it and make sure it never ever gets to Barton Pond. Um, so here's the cleanup criteria over time. Um, again, it used to be three parts per billion, then it was 85, and now we've had the recently announced 7.2 parts per billion is the new proposed standard. Um, hopefully in the next six to nine months, that law gets promulgated, and once that standard's in place, the state can move forward and take some action. This is a messy slide. And I, well, Roger and I talked about this, but what it shows you is if you look at the lines, these are the concentrations of 1,4-dioxane in all the wells over time. So when you look at a new 7.2 standard, there's a number of wells that have concentration above that. Now some are in the prohibition zone, it's an area where people aren't exposed to it, but there's also areas out in the county where those levels are increasing and so the bottom line is there's still a lot of 1,4-dioxane down there to clean up. We've got concerns about data, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but the company used to provide the state with access to a full database. Um, and then several years ago, because uh, local government and Roger Rail mostly raised questions about the integrity of the data, the company pulled the... Um, they basically said, okay, state, you don't have access to our database anymore. We're just gonna give it to you in pieces every month. You need to rebuild it. And so that's what Roger has to do every month, and we think that's silly. 
that we ought to be given access to the data on a monthly basis, and we all ought to be working with the same data. Um, we've got some questions about laboratory methods. There's a new method that you can detect 1,4-dioxane down to 0.07 parts per um, billion, so 70 parts per trillion. It's what we use at the city when we test the river water, um, and we test your water on a regular basis, never had detectable levels of 1,4-dioxane in Barton Pond. We test it down to 70 parts per trillion. But the EPA and the company use a different method. It's not as stringent. We think we want to know when it's at 0.07, not at 1. Um, we've always had some concern that the oversight for this cleanup is in the court rather than with the state agency. Um, we think oversight should be brought back to the regulatory agency. And in this case, the DEQ's costs aren't being covered by the responsible party. In almost every other cleanup it is, so we think Paul ought to be paying for those costs. Um, we ought to th we've talked about whether their court master, an extra scientist, is actually in the courtroom to help the judge understand the complexity of this site. Um, and we've asked, and uh, recently the attorney generals agreed to come to our quarterly card meeting, so we really appreciate that the attorney that's going to be in court representing the DEQ and the citizens of Michigan and Ann Arbor um, has the best available science because we're fortunately a really well-educated community and we can tap into local residents who just happen to be hydrogeologists and their grad students are building models of the plume because the company hasn't built a model of the plume that they'll release to us publicly. So um, we need a long-term plan. It's going to be in the ground for a long, long time. Um, we've got some data, and Dr. Larry Lemke's here, and there's been some modeling that's been done. And they're talking about anywhere from getting this contamination from Wagner Road to the river could take anywhere between 74 and 350 years. We need a lot more data to make that uh, a more defined number. but. Um, we're talking a couple generations out, and we're still going to be working on this. So uncertainties. Um, as is Vince going to do this? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got on a roll. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Uh, Vince Crusoe with the Allen's Creek Watershed Group and CARB member, founding member with the other people here today. Um, so the watershed group has some concerns that we've been expressing for a number of years, and uh, I think we finally got some uh, attention from the DEQ. They've agreed to consider uh, looking at the flows under the city and as they might affect um, homes close into the river. Um, in West Park, for example, we have um, what the city calls seeps, water that's flowing right out of the hillsides, an indication that the groundwater is, is very high, a mile away from the river. Um, being a watershed person, I hear a lot of folks talk to me about their basements being wet, having groundwater problems, having wet basement issues. Uh, one concern we have is that this groundwater may be contaminated and what recourse do the homeowners have or businesses have in dealing with that? Um, I think we're going to have some basement uh, water tested. We'll have the Allen's Creek water tested. Uh, at least that's my understanding that there's a uh, strong possibility of that I would support that strongly and uh, if anybody knows the uh, Huron River, it's a very shallow river. This plume is supposed to vent into the river at 2,800 parts per billion by law. Um, as it migrates through the city, as you get close to the river, you're going to have the, the uh, groundwater very close to some basements, I would think. And uh, from what I've been told, there's quite a few basements that have water issues. I'm glad that we've, we're looking at a much lower standard, 7.2 part per billion. I think that will, what will help greatly. I'm glad the DEQ is um, proposing to do that. Um, uh, the, the CAR group and the county and the city have been discussing a Superfund option, and the Allen's Creek Watershed Group supports that. Um, I think we need strong you know, consideration of that option. Um, if we feel like the DEQ doesn't have the ability or the money to do a reasonable cleanup. So um, I'll leave it to Rita, I believe. 
Hi, I'm Rita Lock Caruso. I am married to him. Uh, <laughs> and I'm a toxicologist. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. So you've heard a lot about this contamination. You've heard about its history. You've heard about how much of it there is. You've heard about how it's moving. You've heard about various uh, regulatory and cleanup actions that have been taken or not taken. And uh, why should you care? And I'm here to tell you you should care because 1,4-dioxane is a health hazard. So when, you, when a person inhales 1,4-dioxane, or if you swallow 1,4-dioxane, almost every bit of that gets absorbed, gets taken up into your body. And then once it's in your body, the blood is going to distribute that 1,4-dioxane throughout your body. What we know about 1,4-dioxane toxicity is really very little. But what, from what we know, the two main organs that are adversely affected by exposure to sufficient levels of 1,4-dioxane are the kidney and the liver. Various regulatory agencies have evaluated 1,4-dioxane for its ability or potential to cause cancer in humans. This includes the US EPA, the Centers for Disease Control, the Department of Health and Human Services, which I have their quote up there. It includes the European Union, and it includes the International Agency on Research on Carcinogens. And they all have come to the same basic conclusion. They have different wording on how they say it. But that 1,4-dioxane is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen. That means it will cause cancer. It's reasonably expected to cause cancer in humans. So why is the wording that way? Why is it hedged a little bit? It's hedged because there are no human studies on the ability of 1,4-dioxane to cause cancer in humans. So uh, it's all based on animal studies, and that's why it's worded as reasonably anticipated. What's the risk to children? We don't know. We don't know if 1,4-dioxane is harmful to children including the unborn. There are no studies on human children. There's, I found one study in rats on developmental toxicology. And what we know from the, what is expected based on the chemistry of 1,4-dioxane and modeling, it's expected that 1,4-dioxane moves very efficiently from the mother's blood into breast milk. And therefore, NIOSH and the Department of Health and Human Services recommend, excuse me, the Centers for Disease Control, recommend that women who know that they are being exposed to 1,4-dioxane should take precautions if they're breastfeeding. So why do I have this guy kicking a ball? Because this is a public health concern. Public health should not become a political football and something that just gets kicked around. We need real action that protects the citizens' health. Thank you, Professor Locke Caruso, and thank you to CARD. I think you get a sense of why I wanted to have them give a quick presentation at the beginning to run through a little bit of the history. There's a lot of it, and I wanted you all to know that there is an active group of citizens, activists, experts, local government officials, and others who are constantly talking about this issue, and I know that there are opportunities for any of you to get involved in a similar way if you are motivated to do so. Now I want to introduce uh, the interim director of the State Department of Environmental Quality. As you could tell from this presentation, uh, uh, those of us who have been working on this issue for a long time uh, we're frankly incredibly frustrated with what's been happening at this site. You've got a responsible party, a polluter, who polluted the groundwater and has essentially been allowed to just let it spread and has not been doing very much to pump and treat, has not engaged in a very aggressive and fulsome cleanup that might get us towards an outcome that we would all think is acceptable. And uh, many of us, local officials and others, are just incredibly frustrated about this. And one of the entities we've been frustrated with over the years has been the DEQ. We've wanted a more robust cleanup, we've wanted more pumping and treating, we've wanted um, uh, restoration of the aquifer and containment of the contamination to be goals of this cleanup, and they haven't been. 
But one thing I can tell you is that for the last few years, we've been working very closely with the DEQ administration. And for the last few years, they've been telling us, we're going to make improvements to the cleanup criteria. We're going to make improvements to this cleanup. You've got our attention, and we are now more focused on 1,4-Dioxane, and we're looking to make a change to how we deal with this site. And so I think it's important that we welcome the DEQ and welcome the director into our community to tell us a little bit about the change that they're making in the cleanup criteria, why they're doing it, and how that can be used to get this community the more effective cleanup that we deserve. Director Craig. Thank you. Thanks. Well, good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here. And it's, it's tough to follow that group, right, because they've lived it. And so I'm the interim uh, director of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. I came back, I was an ag director for a while, and then I was a DNR director for a while, and then they needed a little bit of help at DEQ, so now I'm the DEQ director, and I don't know whose thing just fell, but um, it's in pieces. Um, <laughs> is that an indication, Representative? So. Yeah, I'm still on. So in, in all honesty, one of the first meetings I attended, uh, Representative Ir Irwin said to me, he said, Director, here's an issue you need to pay attention to. And so I, I appreciate, I've worked with uh, Jeff on other issues, so I, I appreciate him doing that. I see another, a number of our other legislative friends in the audience, so thank you for your leadership. So it's actually a pleasure to be here because this is what it's about. It's about active engagement. And it's about listening to concerns, and it's about making some progress. So first, I'd like to uh, introduce our staff. So Bob Wagner, you'll hear from Bob. You're not going to hear a lot from me. you hear from Bob uh, Wagner. He's chief of the Remediation and Redevelopment Division. Michael uh, McClellan, he's chief of our Field Operations Division within uh, uh, the, re the Remediation and Redevelopment Division. Mitch Edelman, Jackson District Supervisor. Dan Hamill, Project Manager for this site. Um, Angela Ayers from the Governor's Policy Office is here, and Polly Sink from the Attorney General's Office is here. So that indicates, yes, you caught our attention, right? And this is an important issue, and you live it every day. And I can't pretend to know what that is, but it is your community, and we need to work together. So what our commitment is is, is a couple. First, I, I, I do want to say, based upon Rita's presentation, our first priority is public health. So we're not waiting for the enforcement standard to be promulgated. We're already working with Washtenaw County. We already looked at wells ahead above 7.2 that were on well waters. And we already extended through cooperation uh, drinking water to that house. And as was mentioned, we've been working on cleanup criteria for a while. And so we just on Friday uh, submitted that to the Office of Regulatory Reform. Now there's a process we go through, and there will be public hearings, there will be public information meetings, and it'll take a little bit of time to do that. But that doesn't mean that we should wait. It doesn't mean that you have to wait until the rule's promulgated before you start doing things. You know, Roger and, and Vince and Matt, they all talked about having contingency plans. There's no reason why we can't start that planning now. In the governor's uh, fiscal year 2017 budget, there's $700,000 in the budget to say, where do we need some additional wells? What data, what data gaps are out there? And how can we meet those needs? So as we promulgate the standard, we'll need to go back to court. We'll need to make that enforceable. And then we'll need to look at it more in total and engage the community. It's absolutely right. There are experts in this community. You have a world-class university in this community. We ought to be able to figure out what the data needs are, what the data gaps are, and improve the predictability. There are many unknowns. And we know that from managing many sites around this state. It's tough to predict groundwater without high-end modeling. And there is some times when there's disagreements. And we need to facilitate that and work through that. So our commitment is to engage with the community, to make sure we're good listeners, 
to make sure we are action oriented and we have a staff that will do that and so with that I'm going to ask Bob Wagner to come up and talk a little bit about the cleanup criteria thank you director Cray I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, the near, generic cleanup criteria that Michigan uses to manage risk and provide cleanup standards for contaminated sites across Michigan. So our cleanup criteria were developed using some broad principles. One, that we use the best available sound scientific information, peer reviewed information, like folks like Rita, with respect to the chemical and physical data for all 304 hazardous substances and for the, the toxicology portion, so the research that is done with respect to the toxicology of each individual substance. In Michigan, we use generic cleanup criteria. That's actually unique in the state or throughout the, the nation. Many states use a risk assessment process for each and every site. So they don't set standards for cleanups. They don't set standards that are enforceable. In this case, we set generic cleanup criteria that is protective of public health and natural resources across the entire state, whether you're in the western UP, eastern UP, southwest Michigan, southeast Michigan, wherever you are in Michigan. Exposure assumptions. So we tailor our exposure assumptions to Michigan, to Michigan residents, the Michigan uh, lifestyle, as opposed to using national standards or other regional standards. But in cases where we don't have Michigan specific information, we will default to regional standards or national standards, whatever is available. Transparency is very important. So one of the things that uh, is very different about this cleanup criteria rule set is that every single source of information and we have 67,000 individual data inputs. So every one of those is coded as to where we got that information from. What study, what state, what entity did the investigation, did the research, did the work. So our rule revision, know that this is a very comprehensive rule revision. It is for 304 substances. So we reorganize these rules so that like things are in the same section, like things with like things to make it easier to read and understand. Some new things we have included developmental and reproductive toxicants that currently are not in our current rules to protect the unborn. We also changed the exposure standard for residential drinking water to include children plus adults. That's not what we currently use in Michigan. We also included mutagenic carcinogens for folks that are basically under the age of, eight, of, eight, of 16, sorry. So addressing early life stage development. We have new rules for vapor intrusion, which may become very important here with respect to 1,4-dioxane in vapors and houses coming off groundwater. Uh, you heard a little bit about that in the earlier presentation. And as I said, we use Michigan-specific data whenever possible. So we basically have carcinogens. And so for residential, we have identified 11 compounds that have a mutagenic effect. We do look at the child and adult as a receptor. And for the non-residential, we assume an adult-only exposure that basically 0 to 16 are not at a commercial business, industrial facility, that sort of thing. So we have a lot of information. So we protect for drinking water. We also have standards for soil to protect drinking water. We protect surface water, what's called the groundwater surface water interface. So this is where venting groundwater is going to enter surface water. We also protect, provide standards for soil to protect that groundwater surface water interface. We have standards for soil direct contact. So that is soil that's contaminated that might be on your hands or on your body and may be absorbed. We have standards for that. We have standards for volatilization to indoor air, both soil and for 
uh, groundwater and for vapors, which we've never had before. So these are the types of chemicals that like to become a vapor. Think about gasoline, how quickly it evaporates, wants to become a vapor. So we now have rule to protect for that. We also have uh, criteria to protect for soil inhalation, particulates, dust that may be contaminated. So we try to protect for all routes of exposure uh, for all Michigan residents. We also have some screening levels. One is called the flammability and explosive, explosivity screening level. So these are things that like to burn, blow up, become a, a vapor cloud and explode. And then we also have what we call CSAT. Some chemicals, gasoline would be an example. Uh, sometimes it's uh, when the release occurs, we actually have a free liquid. So we're not talking about a soil standard. We're not talking about a groundwater or water standard. We actually have numbers for if you have free liquids when you have to look at that free liquid and not use other standards. So a little bit about calculating a health base value. So our cleanup criteria are intended to protect you, Michigan citizens, and we call that the health base value. We calculate values for carcinogens, for mutagenic carcinogens, for developmental toxicants and non-carcinogens. And we use the lowest health base value, and then we compare that to some other standards. For instance, we take the lowest calculated health base value, and we compare it to the state drinking water standard. And by law, we default to the state drinking water standard. So the criteria in some cases defaults to that standard. We also look at what's called the aesthetic standard, uh, commonly known as the secondary maximum contaminant level under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and we can default to that aesthetic standard. For instance, iron, the aesthetic standard is much lower than the health-based standard. So we would default to the aesthetic standard. Uh, solubility matters with respect to how soluble is the chemical in water. In some cases, the solubility uh, number is the number that is the criteria rather than the health base value. And lastly, we look at laboratory target detection limits. In cases where the health base value is below the laboratory detection limit, we default to the laboratory detection limit because that is the only reliable and accurate way to determine the concentration at that level. When you try to go below that, either the method can't do that or it's not reliable, and then you don't know if you're really seeing an accurate number. So uh, let's get to groundwater generic cleanup criteria. This is the table, and uh, so if you look at the fourth line from the bottom, you'll see that there's 1,4-dioxin, and uh, it has the chemical abstract service number, and as you can see, the residential drinking water criteria we are proposing is 7.2, and that CA refers to the source of where that number comes from. Uh, as you can see, there's a non-residential drinking water criteria, which is higher. And there's different, there's, we can talk about the differences there. We see the groundwater surface water interface criteria is 2,800. And then we get into uh, things like water solubility and the flammable and explosivity level. We have a chemical worksheet for every single hazardous substance, all 304. They range anywhere from five to 15 pages long, and this is the chemical update worksheet for 1,4-Docs, and if anybody is interested in the real details, like I know Rita probably is, be happy to provide that to you so you can see what all of the chemical inputs are, what all the physical inputs are, what all the toxicological inputs are with respect to doing the work to produce the cleanup criteria for 1,4-Dioxin. So the next steps, as uh, Representative Irwin mentioned, um, our rule set has gone over to the Office of Regulatory Reinvention and also to the Legislative Services Bureau. Rule promulgation process in Michigan is spelled out in law, and it doesn't matter whether we're updating the building code or any other rule set. Thank you, Roger. Uh, 
you follow the same process. So that process is one of review by Office of Regulatory Reinvention and the Legislative Service Bureau. The public information meetings is something we have inserted. We want to have information meetings so we can have a conversation with those who are interested about how these criteria were developed, where the sources of information came from, and how you can have an effective comment if you have a disagreement with any of that process. Know that we have 67,000 inputs, 116 equations in the rules, so it's pretty complicated, it's pretty technical, it's 300 pages, I, I'm not gonna mislead you here, but what our purpose of having the informational meetings is to inform you about how that's done and have a conversation with you about any hazardous substance that's on that list that you want to have a conversation about. And we want to do that before public comment, review, public hearing. We intend to hold an informational meeting uh, in Southeast Michigan, Southwest Michigan, two in Lansing, one in Northern Lower Michigan, and one in the UP. So we hope to get around the state Feel free to come to one or as many as you like. They will be posted on our web page uh, in the next few weeks. We're working out the logistics right now of each venue. The question was, will they be broadcast on local cable or whatever? Um, we don't have any means for that right now, but we could uh, have them taped and put on our website and then you could view it on your own in your own time uh, Bob, we, just for a second. we are going to have questions and answers when Bob is done So let's just hold those to the end and then I'll do my best trying to recognize you in the order. I see you. Thank you Thank you, so then uh, so the timing is is uh, May and June for the public informational meetings July for the public hearing and, and, the, and basically submit comments with respect to the rules. We respond to all the comments in the month of August, so we have to pair, prepare a written response to every comment the department receives. And then once that's completed, the final rule set would go over to the legislature to the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules for the final step of the promulgation process. So I want to talk a little bit specifically about 1-4 Dachshund because we've had some conversations with various members of the community about understanding the differences between EPA values and DEQ values. So the first thing is, is we use different terminology. EPA uses screening level, DEQ uses criteria. It's an equivalent to a standard. Um, we, use, we both use the same cancer risk uh, of one in 100,000, which means in a population of 100,000, one person exposed for the exposure period would be reasonably expected to uh, incur cancer. Uh, one of the big differences is EPA uses 70 years of exposure. So this is drinking water daily, contaminated 1,4 dioxin for 70 years. We use 32 years that we also use as an average for a lifetime. So why the difference? Well, one of the major reasons is, is that we look to demographic data, specifically how long people stay in their homes to determine what's reasonable and realistic for generic criteria. And 70 years is not the average. It's not what we would reasonably and realistic expect of the population. Now, that's not to say that there are people who do spend 70 years in their home, but for our reasonably, reasonable and realistic assumption, we use demographic data that points us to 32 years. We do the same with respect to how much water you ingest. So in Michigan, it's 2.5 liters. That's the assumption. So we assume that you drink more than what EPA uses, which is 2.0 liters. Body weight matters. If if we talk about any chemical substance, it's about the dose and the body weight. So you know when you take aspirin, you take aspirin for an adult, it's a certain dose, right? If you were gonna give aspirin to a child, it has to be a different dose. So body weight matters with respect to exposure to any chemical. In this case, 
Uh, EPA uses 70 kilograms and Michigan uses 80 kilograms. Again, this is demographic data collected by Department of Health and Human Services that we know is reliable for the state of Michigan. I'm sad to inform you that we're up about 10 kilos since the last time we did this in terms of weight, but it is what it is. Uh, as you can see, uh, we look at both a child and adult receptor as we develop our criteria and EPA did not include children in terms of producing their screening level. Bottom line is EPA screening levels are not enforceable. They're not a criteria, they're not a standard. Our criteria are legally enforceable. They do require persons who have a release of a substance to clean it up to these standards or address the risks. We'll get into that. So, big difference between something that's enforceable and not enforceable. Hopefully this has been informative as to why there's a difference uh, between the two. The main thing is that we have developed these cleanup criteria in accordance with Michigan law and rule as opposed to federal law, which in this case, there isn't anything that would require you to clean up to 3.5. So I jumped ahead here. So ours is developed in accordance with Michigan law and rules. Ours is legally enforceable. The cancer risk level, one in 100,000. An EPA screening level is advisory only. It's not legally enforceable. I will tell you what EPA uses it for. They use it to suggest that a person should do a risk assessment, a site-specific risk assessment for that particular site. So it triggers the risk assessment process for each and every site differently. And then, of course, uh, one thing that a lot of folks don't know is EPA is allowed to adjust the cancer risk from one in 10,000 up to one in a million. So one in a million is more conservative, one in 10,000 is less conservative. Uh, so some DQ actions. We're going to be working with Washtenaw County uh, Department of Health to increase the residential well testing. Using 7.2 as our trigger to take action and we'll provide safe water either working with Paul or on our own using public funds. We want to increase the monitoring well network and sampling because of 7.2. And we've already heard about that with respect to where are the boundaries now, where are the boundaries now and what do we need to do. We will be evaluating risks to one for dachshund from flooding basements or seeps in basements. And we've committed to that. And we've committed to reconsidering the legal strategy going forward and how we proceed with that. Just want to point out to you, um, you can go to the DEQ and look at the Gelman website. It has information on site investigation remediation, or I'm sorry, if you go to site investigation remediation, then click on sites of current interest, you eventually get to Gelman Sciences Inc. That's where you can get the specific information for this site. And then also the link below that is the link to our rules on the Office of Regulatory Reinvention website. And if that's too long to copy down, I think if you just go to ORR's website, you can probably find it pretty quick under Response Activity Cleanup Criteria Rules. Thank you. And um, so that's the end of the presentation. This is how we're going to uh, work this, hopefully. We've got a couple of um, microphones here. So folks could queue up at the microphones, and then we'll just try to get through as many of the questions as we can. Folks have uh, been good enough up front to make their presentations relatively short, because I know that there would be a lot of questions from the audience. So I know we've glossed over a lot of things. But while you prepare to ask your first question, let me ask Bob to try to really quickly handle this one. This site is a bit unique because it's governed by a court order, not the regulatory um, structures of the DEQ. Just, could you just go through that real quick as a first question? What does that mean for this site? So this particular site is governed by the Washtenaw County Circuit Court because the state of Michigan, the Attorney General's Office, and the Department of Natural Resources at the time filed a lawsuit as the plaintiff against Gelman, who is the defendant. And it is a civil lawsuit. And so, uh, for those of you that have been involved in any civil lawsuit, my best example I use is my divorce. I have to plead, beg, argue, and fight for what I thought was my fair share. 
And for any of you that's been through this process, you know sometimes you don't get everything you want. Uh, the decision's up to the court. And so while we have been at this since the early 90s, we are still governed by the court. We still have to go to the court. For example, when the 7.2 new criteria is promulgated for this site, we have to go back to the court and basically ask the court to establish the new standard and then the court will make the decision. And that's pretty much true with every action the department uh, is going to seek from the court or from Paul. Now in some cases, we're able to work with Paul in settlement negotiations to get things done. And the recent extension of municipal water was an example of where we had been discussing this and Paul was willing to do it and was able to do it very, very quickly. So the department didn't have to do it. We didn't have to go to court. We didn't have to have hearings and motions and arguments in front of the judge. Paul simply said, yes, we will provide municipal water. So for every action, every strategy, every plan, we potentially have to go to court to get the court's buy-in, to, to make it a part of the record, if you will, uh, in order to move forward. And that's true even if the parties agree and stipulate, agree to what the next action would be, we still would probably have to file that with the court. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. And I wanted to mention that at the outset because uh, going forward, DEQ is going to be representing us on behalf of the people of Michigan. And we're going to be up against Gelman, Paul, and Danaher, who want to hold on as many of their dollars as possible at the expense of our groundwater and our environment here in Ann Arbor. So I want to stress that the DEQ announcing that they're going to promulgate a more strict standard for this cancer-causing substance is good news because they're our partners in this effort, and hopefully it's a big sign that we're going to be working together going forward to hold the polluter responsible. Thanks. So did you just say, don't be mean to the DEQ? <laughs> no, I was just trying to thank them for coming to the community. I think that they know that uh, there's a lot of frustration here about the way that this cleanup has been mishandled over the years. So fire away. Okay. Well, I, I'm not mad at anybody, but I just moved to Ann Arbor. Mike's not on. Try again. Hello. Hello. Very close. Okay. Um, hi, I just moved to Ann Arbor. Um, I heard about this issue. Uh, I knew we had safe water, so I wasn't worried until I came here today <laughs> and uh, heard about groundwater. And um, I have a sump pump in my basement. So there is a tub of groundwater sitting in the corner of my basement 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So, my, I, so I would like to know if, if anybody knows if, how dangerous that is and what I could do about it. I mean, if the drinking water is safe or I have to drink bottled water or whatever, I'll, take it, I'll put it on myself to take action to, pretend, to protect myself and my family why you all do whatever y'all have to do in terms of, you know, the regulations and the lawsuits and whatever, that could take a while. Got it. But today is that tub of groundwater in my basement. It's not flooded. It's there. Yep. Okay. Is that dangerous? Yep. Hey, what road are you on? What street? Packard. Oh, you're good. Oh, way. Sure. That plume's not moving. Don't worry about it, honey. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got it. So, uh, before you leave, uh, that's a really great question. It's exactly uh, the kind of information we're actually looking for. And so, Dan Hamill, who's our project manager right here, stand up, Dan. So, uh, if you will give your name and address to Dan. Just go right over there. He's ready. And if anyone else has the same question, Dan, if you need to move off to the side, because I don't know how long this, we want to take a look at that if it's in the area of the known groundwater 
contamination or reasonably close. Now, if it's a mile away, we'll probably tell you it's a mile away and we're pretty comfortable. Don't but worry about our, it, everything's our, gonna be okay. Our, we, will, we will collect uh, water samples to test it. So we'll take a look at it. Where are they located? That's the biggest issue. So they might be all over. We'll have to evaluate that. Just talk to Dan. Please give him your name and address. Okay? And we'll get back with you. So So that's a great question. If you have a sump pump and water in your basement and it has 1,4-dioxane, 1,4-dioxane has some ability to become a vapor. And when we talked about vapor intrusion, that could be a potential risk. All right, so it's really based upon what concentration in the water that's in your basement, either because of a sump pump or because of seeps or even flooding. So we'll take a look at that. Um, know that, that we will evaluate that based upon proximity to the known groundwater contamination. There's obviously places that are quite distant. There are places that are potentially closer or in the area of contamination that would be a much higher priority. Yes, yeah, so, uh, dioxin may not be distributed evenly from the top of the water table as we go deep. So it's possible to have 1,4 dioxin very deep under your home but still have shallow groundwater seeping into your home. And if that's the case, that clean groundwater overlying the contaminated groundwater will protect you from vapor intrusion, okay? So it matters where the chemical is relative to the water that's getting into your home as to whether it's a risk or not. Okay, thank you. So, yep, let's keep moving, but if you've got questions about specific uh, groundwater in your home, sump pumps, talk to Dan's your man. And if Dan doesn't give you a good answer, you can you can contact me. <laughs> Dan's over here. Can you... I was going to suggest that when you come over, I'll give you my email address. I have, you know, I, yeah, I can announce it. Well, we'll, we'll, we're going to try and work on getting it up there. Great suggestion. Okay, let's deal with the next question. Huh. Yep. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get I live on the west Thank side, you, uh, right above the plume. And I see that you're following 304 compounds. Is there any way to compare the toxicity of those compounds to each other? I mean, how toxic is 1,4-dioxane? Yeah, so the question was, uh, there's 304 chemicals. How do you compare the toxicity of the different chemicals? Where does 1,4-dioxane fall in that list? Uh, one thing I'll say as Bob's preparing his thoughts is that it might be easy to confuse dioxane with dioxin, different stuff. There's, you know, so let's get on. What's the, what does the chemistry say? I can't give you the specifics right now. Every hazardous substance chemical uh, with respect to toxicity is based upon research that's been done specifically with respect to that chemical. So if we're talking arsenic, there's been 50 studies on arsenic and its risk to humans. Typically, the test subjects, though, are mice and rats and that sort of thing sometimes other animals. Not always human tests, as uh, Dr. Caruso mentioned. Uh, so we look at every single substance, all 304, and we look for the research data, and that gives us the toxicity information that we then use to calculate cleanup criteria. Uh, we have substances that cleanup criteria uh, safe levels would be in the thousands, some in the hundreds, some are, you know, obviously in uh, double digits and single digits with respect to parts per billion. And then we have some really toxic things that are in parts per trillion, like uh, perfluorinated compounds. Um, maybe you've heard about wordsmith, PFOS, and PFOA. Okay, so now we're talking parts per trillion, so much more uh, toxic substance. So they vary across the board, and they're all pretty much unique. I don't know whether Dr. Crusoe wants to Add to that, any perspective? Tough question. What's the question? How toxic is 1,4-dioxane? 
and a range of okay. madness. All right, so I don't think we, we really know how toxic 1,4-dioxane is in the range of badness. What I will use as an example is lead. So the year I was born, it was thought by uh, the U.S. government agencies that 100 micrograms per liter of lead was safe. Now we say 15 is the standard we should take action on. The year I was born, there was no blood lead standard. But when I was five years old, the CDC said that 60 micrograms per deciliter was okay, and now we say it is five, is the action level. And did lead become more toxic no. over that time? Absolutely not. What happened was we learned more about it. Lead is probably the toxicant that has been researched more than any other single compound. And dioxane has hardly any research done on it. So I am concerned. It is metabolized. The target organs, those, the liver and the kidney, I suspect are probably the organs that are most affected by the research that's been done so far because of the metabolism, that that's where they're, they're probably metabolized. Thank you. Next. Okay, I, I have two topics to ask about. One is kind of a four-part question. Oh my. So it's about pumping. Well, we, I mean, when they're talking, I'm like, well, what is the pumping? Like, how do you clean this stuff up? Like, what can we actually do to clean it and not just watch it go by? That's what I want to know. How is it, what's the process? Why aren't we doing more of it? Is it cost or are there other obstacles too? And why is uh, Paul and those guys not more, uh, are there not more consequences that they're not doing what they're supposed to do? But that's, that's kind of a tangent, I don't want that. I want to know about the pumping. What is it? Yeah. How do we do more of it? And okay. Why aren't we doing more of it? Yeah, okay, I, again, I'm Roger Rail. Uh, as far as pumping, treating, you pump and treat. You pump and what? Pump and treat. Pump and treat. So the best treatment system can completely mineralize dioxane, completely take it down to its elemental compounds, which is carbon dioxide and water. So we could get rid of all of it if we pumped enough. Right. You could sell it if it's carbon dioxide and water. It's Perrier. Okay. So it costs, what, billions of dollars? or what? Well, apparently... Uh, the company's not interested in doing that because I actually mentioned that to the qual vice president when he came in 97. I said, you guys could turn a sow's ear into a silk purse. You're a high-tech filtration company. Take some of the money that you're using on lawyers and put it on marketing and completely treat this to carbon dioxide and water and sell it for 50 cents a liter and so make a billion dollars. So we have the technology dollars. to totally treat it, but we're not because of money. Is that what the problem is? Well, they don't have to. Yeah, I'm not talking about to. the company. I'm talking about now it's all in all of our hands. No, so, the company is still treating, and they will continue to treat as long as they're required to. But, but they're not treating it, so I want to know, like, what are the obstacles to pumping and treating all of this water so that we don't have any danger to our health? Well, if it gets to the water supplies, then you have to treat it at the intake of the water supplies. We don't want that to happen because long before it gets to Barton Pond, it's going to hit some of our township wells. And those people are going to have to be on bottled water, and they're going to have to hook water lines up to them, and then the city's going to have to expand the amount of water that goes out to the township. So we can't let that happen. We have to control this with better monitoring and more targeted pump and treat. We might not be able to get it all out, but at least we can keep it from affecting any more water supplies. Okay. Yeah, and I believe that the treatment technology the most effective is a UV technology. They fire ultraviolet rays at it. And I think that the other answer to your question, and Mitch will probably do a better job than I will, is that... Um, 1,4 dioxane is highly miscible, so once it got into the aquifer, it just spread like mad. So the uh, geography uh, across which all this chemical is spread in the groundwater is vast. And so the technical challenge, I think, is just that in order to pull up enough water to get it all, that's, that's the challenge. And it would require the company to pump and treat a heck of a lot more than they are. And currently, they're only doing it at one site at the core. They might have to do it at multiple sites. So how did I do? Fill in what I'm Pretty good. <laughs> Geography vast, geology complex is one of the take homes. And I agree with a lot of what Roger said too. One part of the equation he didn't talk about is in when we talk about pumping and treating contaminated groundwater is what we do with the treated water after it's treated. 
and that is one of many um, issues that's been a source of contention over the 30 years that we've been working with the company to remediate this complex problem. So um, as some, I think Roger said earlier, they're currently pumping, the company's pumping about 500 gallons per minute once upon a time. In the early 2000s, they were permitted to um, pump up to 1,300 gallons per minute, treat it at their treatment plant on Wagner Road once upon a time, uh, up until about, I think it was 2004, they were using this ultraviolet technology, which required a lot of adjustments using chemicals before they could run it through their ultraviolet lamps, the energy required to run the lamps, and then chemicals to adjust the treated water before it then got discharged to an unnamed tributary, to uh, then it went to Honey Creek, and then discharged up to um, the Huron River. So uh, there's been a lot of concerns over the course of the, the remediation at this complex site about what to do with the treated water. And I'll fast forward to 2004 after we had worked with the company. One, this one quick thing in the middle. What is the treated water turned into? Well, uh, he uh, said it's you could sell carbon the, dioxide and water. It's, it, once you, the, the, so the you treat, can't put that back in the ground. That's not well. Safe. That's well, and that's there's another part I wanted to uh, add on to what Roger said. In addition to pump and treat, uh, there's a couple other potential technologies at work. Well, the, the reinjection that you just mentioned could be used for um, treated groundwater and in fact has been used in a couple instances at a couple times in the course of this remediation. Uh, you run into some challenges given the not only the vastness but the complexity of the vastness of the geography but the complexity of the geology is if you put treated water back into the aquifer system that's going to have a, an effect on the hydraulics of the system. And given the complexity of the geology, sometimes it's hard to predict what effect um, that reinjection is going to have. Another challenge with that has been proven at this site uh, to be clogging of the wells that are used to pump the treated water back into the aquifer. Uh, there is some reinjection. I, I think there's still reinjection going on at. Um, Maple Road as part of the overall treatment process. So another potential treatment option is something we would call in situ injection, where you can put some oxidized, because oxidation is definitely the way to treat this 1,4-dioxane compound. The UV light is one way to oxidize it. The current process they use is a combination of ozone and hydrogen peroxide to oxidize this chemical into its its components of um, water and carbon dioxide. And um, so the, the oxidation process uh, can be done in the aquifer too under controlled circumstances. We've worked with the company a number of years ago. They decided to do some pilot tests over at Maple Road to um, test its application in this complex system and it's, it's proven to be quite difficult to do that. But that's another possible methodology. So getting back to your question about pumping and treating, what we're using here is extracting it from the ground, running it through a treatment process, discharging treated water under permit from the department. Um, levels, safe levels for discharge to the surface waters are uh, developed by the department and then the company monitors and we, we, view, we uh, review the compliance of their discharge too. Yep. We're, and we're hoping that the stricter standard uh, allows our partners at the EQ to push for more pumping and treating, maybe a leading edge uh, approach rather than expanding prohibition zones, which I think is the, the do nothing solution that we don't want. So we've got tons of people on the line here. Would you mind? Thank you. Right. you we got a huge line. Okay. Good evening. So what was just said is very interesting to me because Mr. Nod was, uh, sorry, yeah, can you all hear me now? Okay. Uh, what was just said was very interesting to me because um, Mr. Nod was quoted in an M Live article saying that even the treated water that's being discharged into Honey Creek still has dioxide concentrations around eight parts per billion. Uh, Honey Creek flows in the Huron River and then goes into the Barton Pond. That's where the majority of us get our drinking water. So with what was just said, moving forward with cleanup efforts, are we still going to see that type of concentration in the discharge water that's going into our water supply? Okay, so the question is basically, 
why is uh, the responsible party allowed to discharge the water at that concentration into Honey Creek? Is this a Mitch question or a Bob question? All right, let's, let's try it again. So the water goes into Honey, Honey Creek under permit uh, is based upon uh, basically the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Federal Permit Program overseeing EPA oversees the state program. Eight parts per billion is determined to be a safe level for discharge and still protect your water source. Part of that's because of the distance. There's quite a distance between Honey Creek and the Barton Pond intake such that uh, it would be expected that you would not even be able to detect 1,4-Doxin at the point of the intake. And I believe that um, Mr. Nod uh, mentioned that the city has been testing their water specifically at the source and has not found 1,4-Doxin in it uh, previously. I don't know where, is that correct, Matt? I get that right? So. Okay, so my actual question was, we will continue to see that amount being discharged. So yes, is the answer Yes, to the question. answer is yes. Okay. A good follow-up question would be, at what point do we then see it if that continues to happen? But I'll let someone else ask that question. Boy, it's so hard to only have one question, I have to say. Um, I'm Karen Hart. I used to work for the city. I'm, I'm Karen Hart. I um, used to work for the city, so I, and I've lived in town for about 24 years, so I, I, I've been following this issue. Um, One thing, I have kind of a three-part thing real quick. Um, one is, uh, I believe it was Mr. Wagner said something about he would talk further about a set, a risk assessment versus cleanup, and I never heard much more about that because it's my understanding that the state's approach is risk assessment, not cleanup. So uh, from, at least from the latest MLive article, which isn't necessarily to be completely trusted. Um, so a little bit more about that at some point this evening would be appreciated. Another thing is, um, this all happened under a permit from the DNR originally 50 years ago, and um, so permits are permits, and I'm not real impressed with that, but th I'm glad there's newer standards for all this stuff. Um, I, I guess the question that I really have is, is, is the DEQ or whoever at the state afraid that even though Paul Gelman, whoever owns this site, has liability, that at some point they'll just walk away if you push too hard because, and then what happens? Um, because that's my fear, and I don't know if legally that can happen, but um, even if that's a possibility, we shouldn't be afraid to take care of this because it has to get cleaned up. Um, and then the last thing I, I, I guess is a specific question is um, I appreciated the comparison of the EPA. Um, you said it's not a standard, but I'll call it a standard uh, versus um, the 7.2 and how it's derived and what it's based on. But um, there's been a lot of talk recently about trying to get the site uh, designated as an EPA super fund. I, I would like to understand in a very brief bullet points, what's the advantage, or what are the advantages, and what are the disadvantages of that? Okay, while uh, you guys think about who's going to answer this question about the advantages and disadvantages of Superfund, I want to point out one thing, which is that, you know, back uh, 20 years ago, we had a really strong polluter pay law in Michigan that was written by our own Senator Lana Pollock, mm -hmm. and then that law was changed in the 90s under the leadership of John Engler to be a law that was really more about hazard exposure mitigation rather than holding responsible parties to account to clean up their mess. And that's one of the reasons why this cleanup has been so lax and ineffective over the years because the law requires the DEQ to balance the economic utility of the cleanup with the actual uh, harm to human beings. And because we're in the city all on city water, there's been sort of an attitude that well, we can solve this by putting in place these prohibition zones, which are really just um, to prevent people from ever touching the water again. Now, to me, that's a completely unacceptable way to treat our water and to treat um, all of our rights to that water. But to uh, answer the question about EPA or to talk a little bit about that, we'll, we'll go to Bob then. So in response to the question about um, 
the pros and cons of going to a uh, EPA Superfund site. Uh, that would take probably an hour or two to actually go through, but I, but I want to leave you with, with something. <laughs> okay. okay, so I'll try to give you some pros and some, some cons. Uh, and know that the state of Michigan refers sites to EPA for Superfund listing. So we work with EPA as a partner and we work with EPA on all 65 Superfund sites in Michigan. Uh, so when we refer sites to EPA Superfund, they involve sites that uh, basically the, the state's purse is not big enough to cover all the expenses. An example would be the former Michigan chemical site in uh, St. Louis or the Velsicol site, highly contaminated site, maybe the most contaminated site in Michigan and EPA uh, Superfund is uh, managing that site and we work with them and, uh, and that's a good thing for the state of Michigan. Another one would be the Kalamazoo River PCB contamination. So we have 80 miles of the Kalamazoo River with PCB contamination. It's extensive, it's expensive. In this case, EPA is the lead and actually working with some responsible parties to get that work done. And if you recall, just last Friday, EPA issued an order to those three responsible parties to do some cleanup work on the Kalamazoo River specifically to remove PCB contaminated sediments. Know that that order calls for them to do that in order to protect fish that would uh, basically ingest PCBs and then become a source of human health risk for people fishing and eating fish. So there's some good advantages to that uh, and, and EPA can be great to work with. However, I can tell you and, and Mitch could tell you who worked in Superfund the Superfund process, the federal process, is um, nowhere near close to the speed typically of the state process with respect to cleanup. Now, the speediest way to clean up is working with a private party who wants to do cleanup, works with the state, and we get it done. Or the state uses public funds and just goes in and gets it done. But as you know, any litigation is a little longer. So we have, we have had that. Uh, in play here. So I can't compare exactly, but we know that working on 65 Superfund sites it is a lengthy, lengthy process, decades typically. But there also tend to be some of the worst sites. Know this about Superfund. So we're talking the Comprehensive Environmental uh, Response Compensation Liability Act at the federal level. That's what CERCLA is often referred to as Superfund, it requires EPA to look at uh, applicable, appropriate, and relevant requirements. What that means, for big words, is that they have to basically look at what are the state's requirements for the site. So for every Superfund site in Michigan, they look at what are the state requirements for cleanup. So this is a bit circular, because guess what they're going to come back to? They're going to come back to Part 201, environmental remediation, and our cleanup standards to see whether they're appropriate, applicable, and relevant for the site. And they would have to determine that somehow they're not, and that's just part of the process. And that's the process in every state that they deal with. So, so there, there are some advantages, but in this case, we would expect that they would come back if they were the lead and have a conversation with the state. So what's your cleanup criteria for, for one for dioxin? What's your state law say with respect to risk management? Representative Irwin just touched on that. Our law allows for risk management techniques instead of cleanup as long as the public health can be protected. So prohibition zones, institutional controls, restrictive covenants that require soil or groundwater to be prohibited from use, from touching it, from excavating it, from withdrawing it through a well or whatever are also techniques to manage risk to the public in lieu of cleaning up all of the groundwater contamination or all of the soil contamination. So is that, is that um, basically saying that it wouldn't be any faster to get to a cleanup by using the EPA? That meant it might in fact be slower? I don't know that I could give you a judgment today, <laughs> but... Uh, oh, go could, out on a limb. <laughs> We've, Thank uh, you. Yes, you're Thank welcome. You. Uh, Mr. Adelman wanted to mention something really quick. Thanks. Just uh, to address 
the comment you made about the permitting and that all of this resulted from permitting, it's true some of it did, some wasn't permitted, and that's an important distinction for everybody to consider uh, because there is a legal um, uh, prohibition or a legal factor that says if there's a permitted release, then the state can't really enforce. So when we tried this back in 1992, the court found that some of the contamination resulted from releases that were not permitted, and that's what opened the door to hold the company liable for doing that. So that's a minor thing, and then just uh, I'm sure other people are wondering about what happens if the company goes away, where's the long-term funding. I just wanted to mention that that was one of the positive benefits we got from the 2011 modification of the consent judgment, where uh, previously there wasn't something we call a financial assurance mechanism in place. We got that in the March 2011 modification so that the company now has what's called a letter of credit that the department can access if and when the company either doesn't or can't um, continue to do the remediation and they're required under the consent judgment and recently this uh, we've got from them an updated cost estimate that we review uh, the current value of the letter of credit is about a little over $28 million. We're in the process, Dan and others are in the process of reviewing this to look at uh, is that good, uh, is that a sufficient amount of money for the state to implement the remedy in the event the liable party isn't. And think of that as more like a rolling time because we know that under the current remedy that the, the court has ordered that uh, it's going to go on for much longer than 30 years. So every five years we'll adjust that amount and adjust the amount accordingly. Right, one more quick addition. So um, we have a DEQ that um, has been dealing with this for a number of years. Is the EPA going to be faster? It'd be hard to believe that they could be slower. Um, <laughs> in, in a way. Um, and we're lowering the standard here, so it's, it's, it's changing the whole scheme of things. Um, in Massachusetts, the EPA is supplying drinking water to a town that's at 0.35 part per billion. They're supplying water to a school in that town at 0.035 part per billion. So they're using Massachusetts standards, which is one in a million, not one in 100,000. Michigan used to be at one in, you know, one in a million. Ann Arbor is at one in a million cancer risk. The state has lowered it since John Engler to 100,000. So you have to look at the different, you know, there's a lot of moving parts here. I think, you know, that the county and the city and townships are looking at EPA Superfund option. The Ann Arbor Township voted un unanimously to support a Superfund <coughs> petition to EPA <coughs> if other communities do that in the area as well. So they were unanimously in support of that. So, you know, this is an issue we need to really evaluate carefully. It's, it's you know, our future, our kids' future, our neighbors' future. So I think it's, it's very complicated, but, you know, I think we can, we can figure it out. We just need to, you know, make sure we get good data. Thanks. All right, please. Hey, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to the DQ director for bringing all the staff to come. My name is Stephen Lang Ranzini. I'm a downtown resident, and like a, much of downtown Ann Arbor, our family home is in the exclusion zone. I'm also CEO and president of University Bank. Our bank has tens of millions of dollars invested in homes and businesses in the exclusion zone. I've been carefully following this issue for years, attending card meetings when able, speaking out publicly on this issue. Issues I do not see addressed yet tonight, and I'd like to know if you believe any of these statements I'm about to make are untrue. First, designating the Paul Paluma Superfund site means that part of the U of M campus would be in the zone and designated which would damage the reputation of the university, threatening the future of our major employer. 1,4-Dioxane can pass through unbroken skin, so dioxane poisoned water is unsafe to bathe in or swim in. Paul is using O302 system, the output of which is water, dioxane, and another cancer-causing substance called bromate, which as we discussed tonight is not the state-of-the-art UBOX system. The city's water treatment plant could not be used or retrofitted if Barton Pond is contaminated, a new plant would cost in excess of $100 million, but take years to build. I obtained a copy of the city's backup plan from the city manager, and it is to hook up to the Detroit water system. However, without a contract in place, if the city of Detroit was asked by wealthy Ann Arbor for a new source of water quickly, we would need it in days. 
it would likely change a few hundred million dollars extra. Lastly, if the Huron River is contaminated, recreation, including canoeing in the Huron River, would be unsafe. And since that activity is a major quality of life asset, that needs to be taken into account in any cleanup plan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Ramsey. I'm going to have, I think, Bob, are you, are you prepared for this? not sure I caught all of that, but with respect to uh, 1,4-Doxane being a risk uh, through skin absorption, whether you're swimming in it, canoeing, etc., we've looked at that and uh, typically it's the greatest risk that 1,4-Doxane uh, uh, is to the human body is through ingestion and inhalation. And uh, in terms of skin absorption and that being a risk, much higher concentrations, I would say well into the hundreds of parts per billion would be necessary for contact. And keep in mind that when we talk about cleanup criteria, when we talk about 7.2, whether we talk about 3.5, whether we talk about 400 or 500, we're talking about chronic exposure. We're not talking about one time. We're talking about, our assumptions are, for instance, for ingestion, is you're going to drink two liters a day, every day, 245 days in your home, every year, for 32 years to realize a risk. Now, some folks get uncomfortable with this because, as uh, Dr. Crusoe said, we don't necessarily have all the studies in the world to know every answer and she gave a great example with lead. We continue to learn. But what we can tell you is what we know, and that's all we can tell you. So two things keep in mind. We're never talking about one time exposure to 7.2 or 3.5. We're always talking about years of exposure before one would realize an adverse effect. That would be also true if you took a dump out of your canoe and fell in the Huron River. So I don't know about... Uh, the other questions, I, 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 I didn't. So, okay. DQ doesn't want to speculate on what a Superfund designation would do to our property values. I think we can all take a guess. How about you? Um, yeah, when I was working on the dioxin issue in Midland, the DQ was the good guy. So it's kind of. I moved down here in 2004, and I was working with Roger. And I was living at Sunward Co Housing, and they wanted they put a well on our property, and some of us wanted to fight and go to the judge and explain how it would be better to have the, the wells along the right away the road. And it seems like we're still into that situation here where um, they're covering up because they're putting the wells on private property. Is there some way that we can force them to put the wells on public property and then so that we have access to the information? And that if we object to having a well, can we go to the judge and object, you know, educate the judge? Because it seems like that's still a problem that the judge is not being educated. Yeah, well, one of the things that's happened on this site since the uh, uh, rulings is that the judge uh, who made the rulings is retired. So uh, whichever judge gets drawn on any future cases is going to be a new judge. So access to monitoring well locations has been another um, challenging issue at this site over the years. And the Sunward co-housing, uh, we worked with representatives of the co-housing along with the company to come up with mutually agreeable locations because of the the concern about not putting in wells in woods that were determined to be very, uh, that didn't want to be violated by the co-housing. So we, we work, and I think since the city's settlement with Gelman slash Paul, uh, they've got it written in that they're going to work cooperatively together to put monitor wells in public access right away, and that's been working pretty well since, and I envision that that's going to be the case going forward. Just recognize that Access has always been a challenge, and then back in 2004, when we were when DEQ issued its decision to require more active remediation, we did hear from some residents in the form of almost 400 signatures on a petition that people didn't want pipelines and monitor wells in their neighborhood. So uh, that was that was a necessary step. D DEQ determined it was necessary to move contaminated groundwater to a treatment system, and then move clean up clean groundwater to a discharge point. So. That's, uh, those are some of the challenges that we get to deal with in this process. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Roger Kirsten. I live in Virginia, right across from one of the monitoring wells. And I have a sump pump in my basement. I didn't even know I had to worry about until tonight. I just want to thank all the neighbors for being here tonight, because it seems to me the way we're going to fix this is to pump auditoriums full of people as much as pump anything else. Um, for those of us who are not scientists, this is very confusing. I wonder, Jeff touched on this, if anybody from DEQ can help me understand, how does lowering the limit address what's been happening? Because we've been pumping for 20 or 30 years. There's more of it now than when we started. The company doesn't want to spend more money. Obviously, that would be their interest. Does the lower limit give you an extra hammer in the court process? What, what does the lower limit accomplish? Let me take a crack at it and someone can stand up here and rescue me. One of the reasons why your legislative delegation and your city council people and your county commissioners and your water resources commissioner and your township officials have been uh, meeting regularly with our friends at the DEQ to try to encourage them to lower this standard is because once the standard is lowered, that gives us the lever to go back to the core and to say, look, the cleanup that you've approved is based on an outdated standard of 85 parts billion. We've got new science. We've got a new standard. It's not a little bit different. It's dramatically different. It's 12 times lower. It's 7.2. We need a new cleanup that's reflective of the new standard. So the, the importance of the standard is not so much the number on the page, but what it allows us to then do. It allows us to then to go to a judge and say, the current cleanup is not protective of public health. It's not in accordance with the law. And we need more pumping and treating. Maybe we need a leading edge strategy to contain the plume. There's a lot of different things that, that we can investigate uh, as improvements to the cleanup with the new standard. Yeah, and one of the things the lower, the tighter standard will give us is uh, more pressure on the DQ and the company to use the best analysis technique, which is a 522 method that can detect down to what would you say, Matt, 0.07 parts per billion instead of the two older methods that the DEQ and the company are using that can only detect down to one part per billion. So if you're detecting around the perimeter at a very lower level, then you have a more of a heads up if the dioxane is moving that way. And that's one advantage of going to 7.2. I wish it would be lower. I wish it would be, you know, 3.5 <laughs> that the EPA would recommend. But we're, you know, we deal with what we can do, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, and regardless of whether the number is 3.5 or 7.2, the important elements in the improved cleanup that we're fighting for are more pumping and treating, containment and preservation of the aquifer, no expansion, and then also we need a much better contingency plan about what happens if we start to see the plume moving more northward, uh, northerly direction towards Barton Pond. And uh, you know, we need to get these financial assurances from the company in order. We need to get that data sharing happening like it used to happen so that our local activists and our local public health officials can stay on top of what's happening so we can make sure that this company isn't continuing to sell us a line. So those are the main things that we're fighting for in addition to a more thorough relationship with our attorney general. And I'm really happy that Polly Sink is here representing the Attorney General's office, so that we can bring all this knowledge, all this activity, and all this passion that we have in Ann Arbor uh, to bear in that courtroom. So that's what, that's what this is about. Thank you. My name is Andrea Bond. Um, I will be 49 this year. I've been an Ann Arbor resident for 47 years. I've been a resident on Center Drive for 15 years. Um, my question is about the soil. I saw a slide about soil, but I didn't hear any discussion about soil. Is there, has there been any testing? Will there be any testing? Bob or Mitch? I don't know who's, maybe Dan, I don't know. Go for it. Soil has been tested at the plant where the, most of the discharges happen. They had seepage lagoons, they had a fire pit. Uh, soils have been sampled. There's still some dioxane left in the soil. Um, I don't have the concentrations off the top of my head, um, yet uh, the so I think the reference you saw earlier related to cleanup criteria in soil, uh, and we've got a number of ways to determine what they are. Typically we look at what's protective of groundwater and uh, sometimes vapor intrusion like gasoline venting into people's houses, that kind of thing. So. Soil throughout the city is not contaminated with 1,4-dioxane, as Bob mentioned earlier when we were talking about the depth, when we were, were concerned about the uh, water entering basements. Most of the groundwater is 
relatively deep, um, hundreds in one, on the order of 200 feet below the ground surface. We expect the contaminated groundwater to be shallower as it approaches the river. That's one of the reasons that we're concerned and are going to work to understand what concentrations in the groundwater are near people's basements to make sure people are safe from that. So, so there, you said there, the... I can answer your first okay. question about the slide, because okay. that was one of my slides okay. in my Google Earth mashup, that shows the highest concentrations in the soil the last time they were sampled at that location. So there were soil samples taken in 1988 and 1998. And in 1998, the soil sample, the highest soil sample was about, was about a million parts per billion. Now, it turns out there have been a couple soil samples since, uh, four locations. I just found out about this last week because I found out recently that the company has split some of their parcels and sold off some of the parcels. And they did some soil sampling in, in, in conjunction with that. And I plotted where those soil samples were versus the ones with the really high concentrations from years ago, and there's no overlap. So it's like they specifically avoided sampling in the areas where they knew there were high soil samples before. So I don't know if the DQ reviews any of the sales of split or the splits of properties? So I don't know if any of the home, anybody own those parcels? That, because that could be an issue. Did the, did the company tell you that they didn't sample the soils in the areas that they knew were the highest concentrations, like the burn pit? And I'll be putting a map up on the SRSW website in the next day or so that will show all this. So there has been no testing of any other soil? There's a few tests of soils. You know, there's, uh, there's like several dozen soil boring sites, and there's been a handful that have been specifically, again, located uh, where the, not necessarily where the highest concentrations are, but there's been no comprehensive resampling of the soils like was supposed to happen after the five year, remember the five year plan? when everything was supposed to be cleaned up in five years right, in 2005. Beginning. There was supposed to be a soil uh, uh, sample done at that time, and it's never been done since then of comprehensive. So, so how, can, how can you say that the, the city is not, con so the soil in the city is not contaminated if it hasn't been tested? Because this 1,4-dioxane is totally water soluble and mixes in water, so that's what's led to this widespread groundwater contamination is Rain and snow flows through it, and it's going down into the groundwater, and it doesn't really stick to the soil once it's in the groundwater. But it sticks to the soil where the... Where, where they had dumping in the fire pits. Sense, and then another thing as it relates to Roger's question about transfer of the property, the, uh, it's true the company did sell some parcels to um, a limited liability corporation. We worked with them on restrictive covenants that are in place at various parts of the, the property. Um, I believe the, the parts that had the dumping that led to the majority of the contamination were not sold because that's part of the treatment system and the, uh, the location. That, that hasn't been sold off, but our staff did work with the buyer and the company to assure that the restrictive covenants that are in place um, allow the property to be used in a suitable fashion. Can I ask Roger, so how can a resident get their soil tested? Yeah, I want to uh, Well, let's, because we're going to have, all, there's a whole line back there. You can talk to me afterward, but okay. soil testing is not an issue for residents. It's only on the site that you really have to t do soil testing. Okay. Yeah, the concentrations Roger was talking about were actually on the Gelman site. But Ms. Bond, if you're interested in following up in your particular site, I would encourage you to contact Dan and ask some specific questions there. If you're not satisfied with the answers you get from Dan, contact my office, and we'll try to help you get the information thank you, you need. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for having us. Oh, thank you. I have a question about the soil site. I have a question next to Gelman. The soil looks horrible. Nothing can grow there. Have you looked at that? Has anybody gone and looked at the land next to Gelman? Yeah, I've certainly because been Because I there. took a picture on my way, and today it looks horrible, just like it did before and before and before. And you people don't seem to notice that it looks like something from New Jersey where they contaminated all the soil. 
So evidently, there is contaminated soil. And it's sitting right over there next to Gellman. You can go look at it. It's there today. So you have not done anything about that. I have one other question. You're saying that you're checking the soil. You have the Gellman people out there checking the soil that they contaminated. And who is overseeing them? You got a team because you don't. I talked to the one person, one person from DEQ that is checking behind them. So you people all sitting here, nobody's checking what Gellman is doing. Gellman is doing whatever they want. And as far as the governor, I want to make sure he knows what's going on because I don't think he does. This is a carcinogen. I don't have a bottle of it in my hand like the people from Flint, but I'm telling you, it's as dangerous, if not more, because it's invisible. We can't show you how contaminated we are. We're contaminated, okay? And if you don't know that you are, go look at the property that is unmarked, unfenced, that any child can wander into, get scraped over there, and God knows what's going to happen to him because you haven't protected the people in Ann Arbor. What is going on here? Thank you. Yep, thank you for that question. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising that I'm gonna hand this one off to DEQ to take first. If you wanna follow up, feel free. Uh, but I wanna add to that question, is there anything that DEQ can do to uh, get the responsible party to put up signage there or in Saginaw Woods or any of the areas around there that might be affected like the Sister Lakes? Well, I'm hoping that Dan and the woman that just spoke can get together so she can better tell us what specific location she's referring to, uh, and we can look into it. Um, and it, in terms of signage, certainly if there's any reason to believe there's a direct contact hazard, we could arrange that to be posted. We don't have any reason to believe that's the case at Saginaw Forest or anywhere else in proximity to the property at Gallon Owen. So I'm, I'm really curious to find out which which area she's talking about. So over the years, the card group has um, asked the DEQ to um, examine the soil level concentrations and to deal with that. And we were told that this is a water cleanup process first, then it'll be a soil cleanup. And it's some of our contention in the card group that this is con contamination that Roger was talking about, one million parts per billion, could be recontaminating the groundwater. And so we're cleaning up the soil by cleaning up the groundwater, potentially, which is very ineffective. And we really would like to see the DEQ do a parallel effort on the soil and on the water. I think that makes a lot of sense, It'd probably save us a lot of time and energy in the long run. Oh, hi, our representative and Alain, thank you for your leadership. I want to thank all the speakers and um, MDEQ for being here and for all of us braving this um, heat box because huh, climate change is real. Um, there's, my uh, understanding from this is um, why we're all here is from the lack of inaction. And one of the things I don't understand is when we identify a well that is contaminated, why don't, does it turn instantly into a treatment site? And another thing I, want, I don't understand is why don't we see more wetlands or natural um, habitats established around the plume to try to absorb or minimize um, the impact in our community? All right, two straightforward questions. We're going to get two straightforward answers from either Mr. Wagner or Mr. Edelman, perhaps. Or... <laughs> so first question, why aren't wells used as treatment sites when they're detected? Are you talking about residential wells or monitoring wells? It, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter. It could be residential, oh, it, it could matter. be monitoring. Uh, so uh, the, re the court ordered, uh, you know, when the court ordered this prohibition zone in uh, 2004, the, the area in the zone got established. Um, so it's acceptable under law for concentrations above unrestricted criteria to exist within that zone. And um, they don't, the company no longer has a requirement to restore the aquifer to unrestricted use in that area. So we don't have the legal authority to require uh, wells to treat contaminated groundwater in that area. Residential wells, uh, we share the community's concern and work very closely with the county health department to sample and analyze numerous residential wells because we don't want people drinking unsafe levels of 1,4-dioxane. 
big part of the topic tonight is what's a safe level. We're now proposing 7.2 after it's been 85 for a number of years. So we continue to work to identify whether any residential wells are contaminated at an unsafe level, and we'll continue to ensure to assure that people are drinking safe levels. Any wetland tie-in? Uh, wetland, uh, are you talking about for mediation purposes? Um, yes, and uh, preventive as well. So um, it's true, 1,4-dioxane does degrade under ultraviolet light. Uh, and when the problem first got discovered, it was in Third Sister Lake on the Saginaw Forest property that U of M owns, and that's exposed to UV light, and uh, you know you need an awful lot of surface area to treat it, and with the volume of groundwater that we're talking about, I think it would probably be infeasible to talk about using wetlands as a, a large-scale remediation project. That's something that we can certainly look into in select areas. Just a quick comment. Uh, they, there's a site called the Marshy Area on the core area that's really high concentrations. Yes, sir. So just because it's a marshy area doesn't mean it's going to clean up any faster. You still have to provide all the nutrients and all the other things for to help the little critters break down dioxin. The company, this is how it happened. You know, the company tried biodegrading this in water treatment ponds. And when it wasn't working well enough, they dug out the bottom of the pond. So it seeped into the ground better. So you'd have to have a really big area in order to treat this. So pump and treat is really the, the method that's gonna work best. Now, if it turns out the soils can be remediated with FICO remediation or whatever in the shallow areas, that's a possibility. All right. That's Let's keep it moving. The sister lakes, are they still polluted? Oh, thank you guys. Uh, I believe they have, they have hit, so it's a small level, right? There's some hit there. What is it? The, the third sister lake. Third sister lake has how much, do you know? Uh, last time I looked, sub, uh, <laughs> last time I looked the, the, uh, there were seven parts per billion in the, in the third sister lake. Uh, okay, let's try to do that. First least. and second. Nothing in the first and second sister lakes, according to our local experts. Thank you, sir. Thanks, thanks very much. I'm Andrew Rushing from Sio Township. Uh, first, a, a comment. Uh, we keep referring to it as a site. I understand that's a very, a very clinical thing. We've gotten comfortable with that. I'm new to Sio Township. I'm new to this issue. Apparently, I'm 40 years late to the party. It's not a site. These are our homes. These are our backyards. These are the creeks and the ponds that we don't let our children fish in. So be careful about the language. My second question is, there was a slide, it was second to last slide. It had your action plan on it. It didn't have any dates. You didn't have any when we're going to do these things. So the question is, what's the time frame? But I'll let you off the hook here because the answer is, well, there's bureaucracy, there's a state, there's a process, there's lawyers. So the next question goes to Jeff and to Gretchen. What are the legislative solutions for this? We used to have a polluter pay law. We don't have that now. What are the legislative options for this? Because it's not working from the DEQ. The EPA is going to take longer than the 40 years that the DEQ has taken. What, what, what else is there? And finally, one last question. This will be a huge success if it doesn't enter Barton Pond. But are we just kicking the issue to Wayne County? Is the big solution, the, for the, 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 the dilution that we're looking for by the time this gets to Lake Erie? What's, what, what's going to happen? This is a long-term issue. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh... I'm going to invite my friends from DEQ to come up and take that second part of it, but specifically to the legislators, and if any of my colleagues want in the room want to run up to the front and add anything to this, uh, I would welcome them to do so. But we've been working together for as many years as I've been in Lansing on this. We've been meeting regularly with the DEQ. We've been encouraging them to adopt a better standard and to push for a better cleanup, more pumping and treating, leading edge containment, all that stuff. That's what our focus has been. That's what we've been com com communicating to them for several years. And we're, I think, happy that we've got the ball rolling a little bit now, although not fast enough for any of us. There's a second part of that, which is that we've got a bad law. And what are we doing to change yeah. that law? Uh, there's been a couple different uh, tactics uh, that have been talked about amongst the delegation. Um, one of them is just to try to propose a state standard for 1,4 dioxane that would be protective of public health, something like 3.5 parts per billion. That was discussed a lot, and, uh, and, and the delegation really has been working more forcefully on trying to work with the EQ to get them to adopt a science-based standard because we know that there's a chance of success with that. Uh, we know that when we start talking about changing the environmental laws to make them better in a state dominated by Republicans, there's not a chance of that. 
So there's another piece to that, which is that there's another way to look at this, which is that uh, some, of our, some of us have been talking about this a lot. I've been talking about this a lot with Representative Zemke lately, which is, um, you know, what can we do to get our law back to something in the vision of polluter pay? And regardless of whether or not we can pass that, we should be proposing it and pushing it forward anyway. So we're both working on that right now. Um, I think that the complication there is that uh, maybe we can make it even better and let's introduce a truly model law and start pushing for it and see if we can get some traction with our colleagues. But there is a political barrier here that I don't want to be, um, that I want to push to the side. We're working with a majority in the state legislature that values the, um, the economy more than health, that would be my view. Do you want to take a picture of that? So let me take a shot at the schedule. So right now, DQ is acting as if 7.2 is actually the standard with our actions, both with respect to testing residential wells and making sure that we respond to any residential well that exceeds that standard. Uh, so we're not using the old standard. Two, we really believe that 7.2 is the right number for Michigan. And that's why we proposed it. And we stand behind it and support it as the right number to use going forward. There are some other things that need to happen, and you touched on those. We need to look at the monitoring well network. So we're talking about that network of wells around the contamination to find out where are the boundaries, because we have a new standard coming forth. And so again, we want to look at that network and figure out what that needs to look like. And let me say that we want to engage with the community experts on what that network should be like. So we will do that very shortly. We will be inviting community members to sit down with us, pull out the map, where do we need new wells to figure out where 7.2 or lower is. Then we need to look at the contingency plan. I don't know what the contingency plan should say now, but I do know I want to engage with you and have a conversation about what it should inc include. And that includes all of the local units of government that would be part of that contingency plan or affected by it. So again, we want to sit down very soon in the coming month or so and let's start talking about what should the contingency plan look like, not only from the DEQ's perspective, but from your perspective. Uh, with respect to data sharing, we heard about that earlier. That is another thing we want to sit down with you your representatives from the card and talk about what can we put out there available, publicly available on the internet so that you all can see the data, we can share it, we can share what it means in terms of how it's interpreted. So those things are going to happen fairly soon. Some things have to play out. We still have to go through the rule promulgation. We still have to go back to court to change the criteria that's currently in the court documents for the cleanup, and then we need to take the next steps with respect to the monitoring well network, with respect to sampling residential wells, making sure they are uh, below 7.2, with respect to the contingency plan, and with respect to data sharing, and we will do that. Good. Put a, put a time frame on it. Put it on your website, put a time frame on it. Lay out all those meetings, put a time frame on it. We will lay out all those meetings. Thank, Thank you. you. So in uh, defense of the DEQ, actually the DEQ requested monitoring wells in the prohibition zone to the north, and the court rejected that, siding with the company. So there is a, you know, this is a very sticky situation. We need to get this out of the court, really. The court does not have the ability to, to, to manage this. They don't, they could hire a court's master. They have not. They're not toxicologists, they're not hydrologists, they're not geologists. So we need, you know, this is the only case in the state, I believe, that's in a court for a cleanup. Thank you. I will add that DEQ did request some additional resources in the state budget to make those monitoring wells happen at public expense, and that those dollars are still in the budget, and we hope that they get approved so that that extra effort comes to bear in terms of monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I want to just mention really quickly, housekeeping-wise, um, Ann Arbor Public Schools is going to kick us out of here at 830. And I would really like to hopefully get through the rest of these people by 815 so that we can leave in an orderly fashion. So let's try to see if we can't do it. All right. This is my fault we're going so long. I talk too much. My name, my name is Knute Hill. Um, I have a petition to use the best available technology for remediation, um, hundreds of signatures and comments. 
I'd like to present this to DEQ tonight and at least let the local legislature know we we don't we don't really understand I don't think I understand at this point if the change down to 7.2 is going to necessitate any substantive change in the remediation technology I've heard a lot of changes that maybe that might happen what the action plan will be but does anybody have a good guess if we're going to go back to UV uh, does anyone want to take a guess at the treatment technology question? I think there's a lot of folks who are really concerned about the choice of treatment technology for two reasons. One, it's not the most effective. Two, it has the byproduct of bromate, which is undesirable. Well, what are the chances we might get a change in technology? To, um, it's, the company did use ultraviolet and then switched to ozone and hydrogen peroxide. The, this is a great example of some of the, the different risk decisions that need to be made. One reason the company switched from ultraviolet to the current technology relates to conversations they had with county hazardous materials folks about the amount of chemicals that were required to be delivered to the plant on a weekly basis. We're talking tankers full of thousands of gallons of hazardous chemicals that were required in pre-treatment and post-treatment under uh, to accommodate the ultraviolet treatment the other thing was the energy costs of operating the ultraviolet treatment system so the company did an analysis uh, they were able to use less chemicals less um, energy in the treatment process that they're currently employing and they're able to meet the standards that they need to meet under permit that's you know i guess bob mentioned again it's under the clean water act and the state equivalent so they're able to meet their requirements, and it's, it's, uh, it's one of these things where there's not an easy right or wrong answer. Certainly, ultraviolet light is, a, a, is a, one of the best available technologies, yet ozone and hydrogen peroxide are also those technologies, and as long as they can meet the treatment limits, I don't see uh, us ordering the company to change back to ultraviolet light. Just I know to make it quick, is there any way we can have public private partnership here to fork up the rest of the money needed to, to do this right? If if it's just a company doesn't have enough money, they don't need to to meet the requirements. They have the oh, they have plenty of money. It's just a question of how they want to spend it. And is there a chance of that? Yes, I, I think there is, and we're going to be pushing that, and we need your help as well. So I don't know if you want to give those uh, petitions directly to DEQ or if you want to give them to us and run them through us, but the director is right here, and he'll happily take them. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Debbie Schaubman. I live on, in Sio Township on the western edge of La Plume, and I am grateful for the people who are here. Uh, I must confess that I'm a little bit cynical about the process. My knowledge of administrative law in the state of Michigan is far from comprehensive, but my understanding is that the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules is made up of Senate and House members. And I don't understand why there's any sense that we think that the state legislature will agree to moving forward on this. Yeah. And since that's the next to last step, in the approval of the standard, I'm feeling particularly frustrated. And before you answer that, um, I also have a comment, uh, particularly about the private-public thing. My understanding is that Tucson, Arizona has a state-of-the-art facility for the removal of 1,4-dioxane that was built by a company called Trojan UV, which is owned by Danaher, yep. who now owns the Paul Corporation. I want to know why we can't force them or work with them, if we're being nice, to build a facility of similar technology here. Yeah. Well, I have the same question. I want to know why we can't get them to do a thorough mm -hmm. cleanup here as well. Uh, there are a couple differences between what's going on in Phoenix and what's going on here. Part of the issue there was that it was in their drinking water, and so they set up that equipment at their drinking water plant and were required to, you know, uh, do much more to protect public health because it was actually in the drinking water. Well, it'll here, be there soon enough. Here is a different situation. It, it, it may not be. And we actually, that's, I think, our number one goal is to make sure it doesn't get there. And I think we can have even better goals than that, but I think that's the number one goal. The second question was about, oh, the JCAR, Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Uh, I sit on JCAR. I can tell you that um, 
I, I don't want to bet in favor of the environmental sensitivity of my colleagues. However, <laughs> well, this is what I'll say. JCAR does not have to act in the affirmative for these rules to go into place. Really? J correct. JCAR actually has to recommend to the entire House and Senate that they reject the rules. And then the entire House and Senate have to vote to reject the rules. This has never happened since JCAR was set up in the way it's currently set up. And even though the Republicans um, have not, I shall say, impressed me with their environmental uh, uh, protection policies, uh, they are going to be loyal to their governor to some extent. And I think it's going to take something really big to upend uh, this process at this point. And what I'm hearing so far from the uh, leaders of the uh, other side of the political aisle, namely the Chamber of Commerce, is that they don't seem to be coming out in official opposition to this, which I think is another good sign. So uh, I, I, I think we can make it through JCAR. Uh, um, I, I don't want to give you 100%, but I do think it changes things significantly that JCAR has to act in the affirmative as opposed to, uh, to, to stop the rules. They don't actually have to do anything to let the rules go into place. Thank you. you want if I could just add one comment to that. Actually, Bob and his division did a great job in stakeholder engagement. And as he said, there's 304, 307, 304 other compounds. And there's great interest in getting it right. So it's not just a 1,4 dioxane issue. Hi, my question is on the, uh, the prohibition zone and the mechanics behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if you could talk a little about what is involved there, if it's some sort of like three sigma risk line or, um, or what's going to happen when the, the new uh, standards come out, when they uh, reduce the, uh, the threshold by an order of magnitude. Is, uh, is that line going to uh, get bigger? Is it going to get smaller? Is it going to stay the same? And uh, is there any sort of, uh, uh, when I think of a prohibition zone, I'd, I'd imagine everything inside is safe and clearly looking at this, or sorry, anything outside would be safe, clearly looking at the map, it's, it's not. And, so could someone just uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to invite Bob to, but the one thing I want to say is that if we get to the end of this process and we have a stricter standard and the response from the state and the courts and all the public health uh, professionals that are supposed to protect us is to expand the size of the prohibition zone, uh, I'm going to be really sad. <laughs> so let me first start kind of what the prohibition zone is and why it's in play here. So the prohibition zone is intended to prevent exposure to 1,4 dioxin by restricting the use of groundwater. Thus, uh, individual property owners or any other owner within the prohibition zone is expressly prohibited from installing a groundwater well. And that's what it's intended for. So it's called an institutional control under Part 201, and they are allowed and know that throughout the state we have some 4,000 similar prohibition zones for various uh, other sites of environmental co contamination. So with respect to what's going to happen with the prohibition zone, uh, well, first of all, we need to figure out where, where in groundwater do we exceed 7.2 or at nearly at 7.2. And we may have to look to the court to establish a new boundary or we may look to the court to um, take some other actions. I can't predict what that is right now because I don't know what the 7.2 boundary, I don't know what this groundwater contamination thing looks like underground at this point. So it's hard to predict what actions might be necessary and it's also hard to predict what actions the court may take with respect to that new information. New monitoring wells, are necessary to redefine the edge, if you will, the extent of it based upon the new cleanup criteria before we would know potentially the next actions that would be necessary. Does that answer your question? S somewhat. Uh, okay, Roger. If we act fast enough, most of the prohibition zone will be sufficient at 7.2. There is some area around the Montgomery well that's probably already at that. But again, the judge carved that prohibition zone out. That might have to be expanded. I will ask Bob, since he said this a few times at public meetings, that there are 4,000 prohibition zones in the state. Can you say, can you give us a map, a DQ map of where those are? Because I think that would help educate the people 
in the rest of Michigan that was really going on underground. So that's a, that's a great question. And um, actually, we do have a web uh, product that is available. So if you go to DEQ, Remediation Redevelopment Division, and look for Environmental Mapper. And if you click on Environmental Mapper, all of the restricted areas uh, contain the map. They contain a deed restriction, a township or city ordinance, whatever institutional control was used to establish the pro prohibition zone. There are prohibition zones for soil. There are prohibition zones for groundwater. There are prohibition zones that include both soil and groundwater uh, throughout the state. So environmental mapper, DQ website, remediation redevelopment division um, is where they are all housed and you can view them. Thank you. Uh, when I hear prohibition zone, I feel like we've just given up on protecting the environment. It just makes me crazy. Go ahead. Hi, I am a resident in Scion Township. I'm one of the people who had my wells tested. It was actually 2015, I think, not 2014. There were 90 wells. <clears throat> uh, the results came back non-detect. But now I'm kind of wondering what does that mean? Uh, Roger mentioned that there's a tougher standard. And I'm wondering if that's what was used to measure my well or not. He says yes. Yeah, you want to take it, Roger? Quick answer, yes. Uh, it was probably the state that did it. I, I think. I yeah. don't even know for sure. What, no. What's your address? Uh, what I live at, uh, I live off of um, Dexter Ann Arbor, Pratt. I'm on Florence Road. Okay. Well, it's probably the one part per billion standard. So if, it, you know, this is one of the things we want the, the state to do is use the 522 standard that can detect it sooner. So if you're at 0.5 parts per billion, you know it ahead of time. And then I, I just wanted to know if that tongue, I'm right at the edge of this little tongue that's heading towards Honey Creek. If that were to get up to something that made my well test at 7.5, let's say, and we had a 7.2 mm -hmm. standard, yep. what happens to me? At that point, you want to take it, Mitch? Yeah. yeah. So this goes back to part of Bob's answer to the earlier question. Uh, and the other gentleman's question about what, whether the prohibition zone will get expanded. While we can't predict the future, Bob's absolutely right that the, the prohibition zone is put in place to make sure that people aren't exposed to unsafe levels of drinking water. Um, when One of the other things we negotiated when, in the March 2011 consent judgment was trigger levels in some of those monitor wells on the northern part of the prohibition zone, sort of in the vicinity of where you live, and uh, those were a little less than a quarter. They were 20 parts per billion, our, and our currently enforceable standards 85. We've been telling the public and we've been telling the company for years that when and if our, con our enforceable criteria goes down, um, we're going to have to renegotiate those triggers. So um, while, it, again, it's hard to predict whether and where a prohibition zone might get expanded. I would agree with Roger that it's very likely in the southern part of the prohibition zone, concentrations below 85 but above the 7.2 exist. And one way to address the risk there may be to expand it, whereas in areas in the north where we've got many more residential wells that we are concerned that people don't drink unsafe levels from, that we would uh, that our contingency would include options to provide safe drinking water in Meaning some form. hooking me up to some city source? Or that would be one potential water? option. Another one is work with the company to have them extract water and create a hydraulic barrier and treat that and dispose of it properly. There are many options. We haven't made any conclusions yet. But the important part to note is we, we fully anticipate relooking at the triggers and making sure that there's adequate time to react to that so that uh, we don't have to provide people bottled water for a long time. And if anybody it does have water that's above the new expected standard, uh, you need to let us know, let Washington County Public Health know, and we'll be working to try to get those options hooked up. Uh, so I, oh, <laughs> where am I speaking? I think that the, the question that's probably on a lot of people's minds, given the context of the um, uh, issues that have uh, come up in Flint lately, are 
um, do the numbers that the state is using to, um, to, to make their determinations about what levels are safe, what uh, levels are likely to cause uh, cancer, at which uh, of these thresholds that people have been talking about, um, how do those numbers add up and why do those numbers seem to differ so much from um, the federal numbers? So what I want to know as a medical statistician is, um, are, are the data publicly available? Can um, people get this and look at this and verify what the DEQ is telling us? And uh, you know, is, is what, what is the level of transparency as, as someone who, who lives in the area and is very concerned about um, you know, the, the, you know, <laughs> what, what is real and what is a smoke screen? Yep, the transparency is a huge concern of the local officials have been working on this for a long time, city, county, township. That's probably one of the things we've been fighting for is to get the, the data again from the company because it's so important to be able to truth out what they're telling us. As far as the DEQ's process, that's one of the reasons why uh, this criteria has taken so painfully long to announce is because the DEQ was committed to making a transparent calculator that would be publicly shareable so that you could find out how they built their model and what numbers go into it. Is there a location that they could easily find that Bob or is it not online yet or what's this what's here's what we can share with you right now we can share with you uh, the rule itself and know that there are tables in the back of the rules that provide all of the individual chemical physical and toxicological data for every hazardous substance in addition to that we have what are called chemical update sheets, and we have one for one force of dioxin. It's about seven or eight pages long, and it contains even more detail with respect to the data and the inputs we use to calculate 7.2. So we'd be happy to provide that to you. At a later date, when we're able to, we hope to roll out our electronic calculator, which is simply a uh, electronic calculator that basically does all the computations of some 67,000 inputs using 116 equations. We're not able to do that right now, uh, but we will be rolling that out later. So I would be very interested in seeing that data. Yep. Thank Thanks. You. Hi. So I understand the depth of the plume is typically really deep, like a, maybe couple, 100 feet or 200 hundred feet. feet but from what I've heard today, there are areas in which it's much shallower than that. Like like a basement is not 100 feet deep. And then you mentioned seepage through hills in West Park. And so my question is actually about fruit trees and vegetables, which are, because fruit and veggies are mostly water. Um, is there any way we can find out? Um, I mean, the area I live in is relatively wet, and, and I never thought that the roots of my apple trees were gonna go deep enough to pick up on this contaminated groundwater, but that's actually my question. And, yep. and if you're closer to the river, it's kind of, kind of on the wet northwest side. So. Yep, I'm hoping that someone can help me with this, but I do want to say that this becomes more of a concern as the plume gets closer and closer to the river, where it's out at like Westgate and every, you know, where it's at the higher concentrations, it's pretty deep, but as it gets closer to the river, it becomes more of a concern. So yeah, it's supposed to vent into the, this part of the plan. It, the prohibition zone protects supposedly the population, and it's being allowed to flow through the city and vent into the river at 2,800 part per billion by law. Um, but as you get, if you've been down to the Huron River, you know it's a very shallow river. It's maybe a foot deep at times. So that water is going to vent within a foot of the surface at the river. There are locations, you know, as a watershed person, I know I get a lot of people ask me about, you know, wet basements. What can we do about our wet basements? A lot of basements have been replaced because they're undermined by the water um, just flowing in their neighborhood. So I know at West Park we have seepage coming right out of the hillside, and that's a mile from the river. Now, the contamination will be lower at that location, and it's still not at West Park, as far as I know. Uh, it's getting there, but it's not quite there. Um, it, we're, it's in my neighborhood, which is on Glendale, just across the street here, at one part per billion, theoretically. I mean, that's an estimate. So as, it, as we move on down the years now, we're going to get this farther and farther into the city, farther and farther into the west side. My concern is the homes that are within a mile of the river. And Ann Arbor Township is worried it's going to go under the river. So that's a totally different issue. Does anybody have any uh, fruits and vegetables? I'd say I'd worry more about your shingles, maybe. But maybe. Uh, Just make sure you send Dan Hamill an email with your address. We can identify where you are and location to monitor wells and get a gauge the depth to contaminate groundwater. That's an important thing. Another thing on the vent of the Huron River, 
the company's model is it'll vent. We've been saying all along, as it gets closer to the river, we're going to have to explore the depths uh, that the contamination is relative to the river, because we've seen at other sites throughout the state that the contamination can follow the axis of the river, migrate. Sometimes it can underflow, too. You're right, Representative Irwin. So uh, as it gets closer to the river, that's going to be another aspect that needs to be studied and understood and risks managed. Thanks. So I have a um kind of a continuing yeah, question to this. Um, I live around the corner from the family who had the three kids who were exposed to that um, 1.5 dioxin. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I live around the corner from that family who was exposed to um, the 1.4 dioxin over three years. Um, and so if we determine that in my, uh, in my basement at where the sump pump is, um, that I have 1.4 dioxin, how does that affect my soil that's in the same level and my children who are playing, they're just three and a half year olds, playing on the ground? How do I know that, you know, if the water level changes that they're not affected by vapor coming out of there? And how do we know it doesn't change from one day to the other, basically? I mean, of course, it doesn't change that quickly, but... Yep. So the question is, is uh, how do I know what my risk is mm -hmm. to groundwater that's uh, in my sump pump or proximity to my garden or, or et cetera, or the vapors? Uh, so it starts with testing. So basically, we need to do testing, um, no different than, uh, you know, checking your uh, um, blood for cholesterol. And through repetitive testing, then we get an idea of what your trend is. And uh, is it low levels and is it staying low levels? Are the levels gradually increasing or the levels high? And then we respond accordingly. So it just starts with tests. Please contact Dan and, and we'll go from there. Okay, my second question is, um, I know that it was mentioned that Allen Creek hasn't been tested yet. Um, the pond in West Park, I'm assuming it wasn't tested either. Um, how, like, if we, tested and it comes out that 1.4 dioxin is indeed in there, um, will we place any signs around it so that dogs and other animals won't be drinking the water and kids won't be playing in it? Because as of now, kids are actually playing in that pond. Okay. Um, I don't know specifically where that is, but I was listening to Roger and I believe he was indicating that the groundwater contamination is some distant yet from that location, is that what, or we don't know? Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe the leading edge might be. Maybe leading yeah. edge. Mm -hmm. So it is about testing. So but we just we need put to test. signs up if that's the case? Or how do we determine that in the city? Like how, It depends you know, on the concentration. So, uh, but, you know, signage is one way to, to do that. But, it, you know, um, dogs and cats and other animals don't read signs. They kids. require human no, uh, <laughs> participation. So there may be other ways that we can address that. Uh, and basically either uh, reroute that water so it doesn't come to the surface um, or potentially treatment or, you know, again, it, it starts with testing and we go from there in terms of what ne actions are necessary to address the risk, so. Okay. Well, I can just give you an example. We, we were testing first and second sister lakes and it turns out Weber's had a well that was pulling water up, cooling the restaurant, discharging to their parking lot, coming into First Sister Lake. So First Sister Lake hit 16 parts per billion all of a sudden. So DQ fixed that. Paul paid for a new HVAC system. But we posted signs around Dolph Park then. So we tend to be fairly good about letting residents know when we know something. Um, so I think as we get more information, if anything, we're at the surface where the public would be exposed and we knew about it, we'd probably make a presentation to PAC, the Parks Advisory Commission, and we'd put up signs and make sure people knew. Thanks, Matt. Do you want to add something? Well, let me just say, through testing, if we find that there's a risk, I think you, can, um, you would expect us to go back to court and go to the judge and ask for some action. I can't predict what that action would be right now because it depends where concentrations and exposure, but I think that would be a, uh, a normal thing for us to do, and I think you would expect us to do that. My name is Larry Lemke. I am a hydrogeologist, a resident of Ann Arbor. I've been studying this site for 19 years. 
I'm really pleased that the attention to water quality has resurged. And I'm very pleased and delighted with the tone of the meeting tonight. So thank you, everyone, and everyone who saw, stayed late. I think the headline news tonight is that the standard is going to be reduced from 85 to 7.2 parts per billion for drinking water. But my question and my concern is, what about the groundwater surface water interface criterion? That's the 2,800 parts per billion. I get it that 85 is going to 7.2 because we've had an increase in the recognized toxicity of 1,4-dioxane. Why then isn't the groundwater surface water interface criterion also going down? And that's the one that's really going to count here because everything that's going on inside the prohibition zone is governed by that criterion. And the company is not going to be required under the current agreement to clean up anything inside the, the prohibition zone that's less than 2,800. That's a huge, huge difference between that and 7.2 that we've been talking about. So all the questions that have been asked before mine about what about the pond, what about the seepage, what about the basements within the groundwater prohibition zone, the relevant standard is 2,800. Why is that not coming down as well? Thank you for your work, sir. Thank you for the question. That is a great question, Larry, and uh, I'm glad you asked it. So 2,800 is a criteria set for protection of aquatic life. So we're talking about fish and daphnia, things that live in water. We also have a number with respect to protecting surface water that is used for drinking water or source water. And for 1,4-dioxin, that number is 34. And I don't know that we've had a lot of conversations about that. But I think that would be something to have a good conversation about. You're probably wondering, well, why is it 34? And I can't tell you right now. But I know that we have people who can. And so I think we need to have that conversation. And also, where does 34 apply? Because I'm fairly certain 34 does not apply in Honey Creek. It probably doesn't apply for upstream areas of the Huron River. But at some point where the Barton pond intake is, 34 legally would apply. So I think it's a great, uh, great question. And we should talk more about that and get together. Certainly, if we're looking for leverage to try and move this, this whole process forward, 7.2 is good. But the key lever, I think, is going to be that other criterion that the groundwater prohibition zone is governed by. Thank you. I guess I'm the last one up here. Second to last. Second to last? One more? Oh, good. I'm not the last one. Um, clean water is a nonpartisan issue. <laughs> it should. It it is. I mean, I I think it's safe to say that uh, even Governor Snyder admits that there are systemic failings at the DEQ on enforcement, and that's the problem we see here. We see Flint, Ann Arbor. We're not getting enough enforcement. We're not getting the regulations, the levels that we need to protect public health and safety. We're seeing it also extend to other areas, all the way from water quality to groundwater, also into wetlands, which give us the clean water that we use to dilute the pollutants in our watersheds. We don't have enough testing in any of these watersheds that's comprehensive enough to tell us that we are all safe. As for the EPA, why not engage in the Superfund process and in the interim continue the efforts that you are doing maybe we will get something the quality and level of what's in tucson in terms of geological monitoring and geohydro um, hydrological modeling there's a lot of new techniques including ground radar that we need to be seeing out here used to look at the type of geological composition that we have in our ground because there is area uh, there are shallow or areas of, they're called drift aquifers. They are uh, at 40 feet or less, and with a, how miscible and how mobile the water is, we are going to see some of that come up. We just might not know where that's going, and we need to monitor that. And I think there was a good point on what, what can we do in terms of doing smaller things to engage 
now to improve our situation. We've had 40 years. Okay, so maybe this project is a small one and it makes a small impact, but if we have a lot of little small projects, we know that that can add up to a lot. So maybe look at some micro-remediation techniques to look at doing small constructed wells and uh, smaller constructed wetlands with phytoremediation. And then the, the last thing I want to point out is we need to be looking at pushing the limits lower. The rest of the world is using one to three parts per billion and in places under one part per billion for drinking water. Uh, the average uh, weight that was given in here, 80 kilos, that's 176 pounds. And I can't, I, I, I can't imagine a child being at that average weight for the entirety of their childhood. There's a baby so, so we, <laughs> so we need to have some of these, uh, the science and the data that this is based on reevaluated to make, make sure that the limits are actually low enough to support safety for the public health. So what I would ask you to do is continue to work to improve the situation here. I lived in Ann Arbor and I've heard about this growing up and it's still here and I can't understand why it's been allowed to proceed uncontained for all of this time. Please stop looking at this as something that it's okay for it to continue to spread. It is not. We need to stop it. It needs to get cleaned up. So I think what you're hearing loud and clear is that people want a more aggressive cleanup. They want um, you know, this company not to be allowed to just simply get away with having polluted the ground. They're concerned about what that does to our health, our environment, the moral hazard. What does this do in other parts of the state where polluters are shown that they can pollute the groundwater and just leave it there? Um, so I don't know if there's any other response uh, to that other than my personal frustration, but if anybody wants to take it. Okay, yeah. Hi. I am the last one, and yes. I'm okay with the last one. Thank but my question that. actually. Oh. Yeah. Put it, just put it Hello. right in your mouth. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm the last one. I don't mind being the last one. It's fine by me. It kind of follows up with her question, although I have a second one after that. Um, you did this average person, 176 pounds, and you talked about how it doesn't really affect children because of the course of their lifetime, their exposure. But my husband, who's a statistician and deals with these kind of medical numbers all the time, understands that you can manipulate these numbers. And that's really kind of fudging it, isn't it? Because they're, you're, the way you're calculating it doesn't account for the fact that toxins almost always affect children more, faster. They have smaller bodies, tissues are still developing. I think it's disingenuous to say children are not the ones at risk. I think it's incredibly disingenuous. That's my first question. My second one is, I called the governor's office when I first heard about this. We actually don't live by it. We're actually from Celine. But, uh, excuse me if I'm out of breath, this child is heavy. <laughs> but um, we have friends who live over there, and it's still our state, and it's still our water, and we still care. So we called the governor's office. I was on the phone for hours while my other daughter, who's over there playing on the cell phone, was at school, and the governor, nobody at the governor's office could tell me they ever heard of the problem. Not one single person. Every boy, we, and when I mentioned this meeting, they wanted me to give them the information. Well, do you know where this meeting's at or who's holding it? This is your milieu, it's what you do. Why aren't you talking to the governor? Or is he just completely fibbing? Because it's one or the other. Either his people are completely lying, and I've made several phone calls because of course they never call you back, or nobody has been in contact to tell him. So which one is it? Yeah, so uh, a couple different things to unpack here. Uh, one is uh, this whole business of what, is, what did the governor know and when did he know it? Uh, I, I don't know, to be, to be quite honest with you. I, I don't uh, get to spend a lot of time with the governor. If I did, I'd talk to him about... Forgive um, me for interrupting then. So yeah. what you're saying is that you have made no effort to communicate this with the governor. No, that's not what I'm saying. No. Okay, so have you made an effort to communicate this with the governor? Yeah, we, in fact, we've been talking with the governor's office about this situation, uh, and we've been doing it in concert with a whole team of local officials. There have been individual meetings with the governor about this issue. So and I think that's one of the reasons why the DQ lying. decided yes. to... I, I didn't catch what you just said. I'm sorry. So then he does know, and he is lying. Either he's been informed and he's lying, or he hasn't been informed. 
Well, I don't know what the, the nature of your conversations were with his staff. All, all I know is that we've been lobbying him, we've been lobbying the DEQ, and I know there have been conversations between his office and the DEQ's office, which is part of why we're here today and part of why we're talking about They are about completely denying any of that. Yep. They well, are completely denying that they have been told anything yeah. at all. Well, it may come as no surprise to you or anyone else here that mm -hmm. I'm not standing up for the governor, uh, and I'm also not standing up for the way that the DEQ developed their numbers. I'm very happy that we're working in partnership, and I think we're actually moving towards a better cleanup now, and I'm, I'm, ha I'm hopeful about that. But going back to your earlier question, uh, I agree with you. I wouldn't have used the same exact assumptions that they used to develop their exposure pathways, and it probably wouldn't have been satisfied coming up with a number of 7 points Two and so much of the rest of the nation's at 3.5. But if you were here earlier, I think uh, Bob Wagner laid out how they got to those assumptions. And um, regardless of how dissatisfied we are about the number 7.2, it is um, you know a factor of 12 more protective than the standard we were dealing with before. So we've got some improvement. We've got some commitment to put more monitoring wells in place. We've got a commitment to work on the data. We've got a commitment to work on the court case uh, more thoroughly. And I think that's what we've got going forward. And we need to keep working in partnership with the DEQ while we explore opportunities with the EPA. And we need to keep fighting for a better cleanup on this site. That's, that's that's certainly what I'm committed to do, and I know there's a lot of other activists and uh, local officials who are right there as well. Well, yeah. then I guess my question would be, is if 7.2 is the best we got right now, if we somehow get whatever it is we want to get done to 7.2, since that is clearly not good enough, otherwise it would be what everybody's using, are we going to push past that further? Because it still leaves children at risk. There's nothing that anybody can say that say, no, we have this study that says children aren't at risk. What we do know is children are always more at risk when it comes to toxins. We, we need more people like you. A Not lot more. <laughs> A lot more. I just want to say, I, I'm really grateful everybody showed up and, and let the new DEQ director see what, what's going on because sometimes the, the information doesn't flow up or over and around. And that's really probably what's happened with the governor's office. But if, uh, if you want to learn more about this, again, I'm Roger Rail, Chair of SIA Residents for Safe Water. So if you go to srsw.org, we try to keep everything up to date there, including links to all the other sites of all the other stakeholders, including the DQ site. So if you don't want to write down that long URL, I already go, did. Go go to go to SRSW and click on the link, and it'll get the get you to it a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, you, you want to talk about exposure? Then, I, I just wanted to touch on the child exposure because I did not cover that in my presentation. It would have took a few more slides, and about uh, two equations, which are really long, but we look at child exposure with respect to residential drinking water, and we look at it from a zero to one year of age because we're looking at body weight, skin surface area, and obviously a, a zero to one year old has a different developmental state. We also look at it from ages two to three, and then we look at it from age three to six. So we account for those age categories in terms of the child receptor, we look at also their ingestion rate of water because it's different than an adult. So I just want to let you know that it is all part of the calculation of the 7.2. We could give you all of those details uh, if you like at a different time. Okay, so uh, just a couple. Yes. The handout that was available at the beginning of the meeting, is that going to be on the website at eWatchDog? That was a Washtenaw County fact sheet. I apologize we didn't bring enough. We ran out. It is on the CARD website, which is um, card.ewashtenaw.org. Um, you can also track me down. I have my cards. I can give you more information. The fact sheet is on there if you want a hard copy of it mailed to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more question in the back. Yeah, I, just, I just want to point out to everybody in the room that when everybody talks about going back to court, that is a locally elected judge. Okay? And I think that all of you know that it's vitally important that that locally elected judge does the right thing. 
and then they don't, there's a process for that too. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, if I could thank Representative Irwin. We're 10 minutes past. Uh, we'll still be out in the hallway if you have some questions, but just a couple comments. So this issue is 30 years in the making. 50, 50 I'm sorry. 50, <laughs> I stand corrected. Thank you, Roger. So this is not something that just happened overnight. And the individuals that ran that models, just so you know, they weren't Republicans, they weren't Democrats. They were toxicologists. And so there's a public process. And that's the reason why we've been very transparent. So now's the time to enter in on the models, on the assumptions, if the numbers are right. We're in a community that has a number of PhDs, I bet, that understands the toxicology. So if Bob and the toxicologists that was broad-based made some uh, rash assumptions and didn't get it right, there's a process for that. And so I would really encourage you to do that. That's one. Two is, thanks for allowing us into your community tonight. So what have we committed to? We've committed to address part of your frustration. Our engagement model wasn't as perfect as what it could be. Is that true, Roger? We could probably perfect that a bit. And we said we would do that. We said that with the legislature's help, there's $700,000, so we can look at monitoring wells, we can do some contingency planning, and we don't have to wait for the slow creep. That's here and now. That's the FY17 budget, and thank you, Representative, because these are some of the issues that are being addressed. We're talking about sharing modeling. We're talking about changing the legal strategy. To the comment in the back, part of this is a court decision. So DEQ, sorry, I cannot go out arbitrarily and make a decision. I need your support in the community. I need the high science, and we have to change the legal strategy a bit. PolySync is in the room, and the Attorney General's involved, and they said that we would, be a, uh, we would be a better partner in the litigation. So as we look for a path forward, this really is a good meeting. There are some things that we can do to address the here and now, but let's be thoughtful about the strategic investment of our time, energy, and effort. And then let's make sure that the young children of the future, we don't have to wait another 50 years. So technology will improve. And as technology improves, we ought to be flexible and creative enough to allow that integration into the system. So we'll continue to work with our legislative partners, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Good night.